Hey there, Mr. Redder here. Welcome back to another episode of Reddit Podcast Stories, where today, am I the jerk for taking my sister's dog after she gave my puppy away? I know the title sounds goofy, and you might think that I'm the bad guy here, but I, 24, female, had a six-month-old greyhound pup, and I named him Goose. I had always wanted a greyhound, and I was excited. I was planning on visiting another state with a few girlfriends of mine for only a week. I needed someone to watch Goose. My sister, May, who's 32, offered to watch him, and I told her I would send her emergency money for Goose, for food, toys, and whatever else he needs. She agreed, and my niece, who's seven, loves Goose, so I thought everything was great. I went on my travel with my friends, and it was lovely and great, but on the last day, May called to say Goose ran off and she can't find him. I was very devastated when I heard that, so I came home from my travel a bit early to see if I could find Goose, but I couldn't. I asked May how he got out. She told me she just let him out so he could stretch his legs. After 20 minutes, she went to go get him and saw that he wasn't in her backyard. She panicked and that's when she called me. For a while, I was just depressed. All my friends tried to cheer me up. It held for a little while, but my best friend Cora found on Facebook a picture of a small family with my dog, Goose. It was one of my niece's friends. So I hurried on and contacted them to tell them that that was my missing dog, Goose asking if I can have him back. They said no, and that May said I didn't want him back. I begged and said he's under my name and chipped, and I never said I didn't want him. It was all false. I was in another state for vacation. May was supposed to watch him and not give him away. I told them I would pay them however much just so I can have him back. They just blocked me. I went over to May, and when she opened the door, I freaked out, demanding that she tell me why she gave my dog away. She said that wasn't true, that he ran off. I told her to cut the crap and tell me the truth after I showed her the pictures and messages. She told me she needed the money from my niece, that the money they needed was more important than a dumb dog. So I barged into her house and I took her dog, Daisy. She yelled at me that I can't take Daisy. I told her that since she gave my pup away, I can take hers. Since my mental health is more important than a dumb dog, I said she better get Goose back or I will take legal action. I left with Daisy and I'm now sitting at home wondering if I'm the jerk. Everyone sucks here. Take your dog back. If he's chipped under your name, then just report him stolen and enlist the authorities' help in retrieving him. Theft of your dog doesn't give you the right to steal her dog. Just call the cops and get your dog back. They bought stolen property and you can prove the dog is yours. Suspended for being a minute late? Fine. Enjoy handling the biggest project without me. So I'm Mark, and for the past five years, I've been working at this mid-sized tech company. It's been great, or at least it was, until six months ago when we got a new HR manager, Susan. Now, Susan is the kind of person who loves rules a bit too much. She came in with this idea to revolutionize the workplace, but all she did was implement a bunch of unnecessary and strict policies. The one that really got under everyone's skin was her new attendance policy. It stated that if anyone was even a minute late more than three times in a month, they'd face immediate suspension without pay. No excuses, no exceptions. This was crazy, considering we're all seasoned professionals, not school kids. But Susan was adamant, and the policy was enforced to the letter. Now, I'm usually very punctual, but life happens, right? Just my luck, I ended up being late three times in one month. The first was because of a massive traffic jam, the second was due to a power outage that prevented my alarm from going off, and the third, well, I overslept. Each time I was barely five minutes late, but Susan didn't care. She got me with a suspension notice. I was fuming, but then I remembered something important, our employee handbook. I had read that thing cover to cover when I first started, and something about the suspension policy stood out to me. I dug up my copy and found the section I was looking for. The policy stated that suspended employees must leave company premises immediately and are not allowed to engage in any work-related activities during their suspension. A plan started to form in my head. You see, at that time, I was in the middle of a critical project for a major client. It was a huge deal for the company, and I was the lead developer. Without me, the project would grind to a halt. So I decided to follow Susan's policy to the letter. The next day, I walked into Susan's office and I handed her the suspension notice, along with a printed copy of the employee handbook suspension policy. I told her, as per company policy, I will be leaving the premises immediately 
and will not partake in any work-related activities during my suspension, including the Johnson Project. The color drained from her face. You can't just leave the Johnson Project, she exclaimed, but I just shrugged and said, Company policy, Susan. I'm sure you wouldn't want me to break the rules. I gathered my things and I left the office. The fallout was immediate. The project team was in disarray without me and the client was getting antsy about the missed deadlines. The CEO himself called me two days into my suspension, begging me to come back. I explained that I was merely following company policy, as enforced by Susan. Long story short, the CEO had to intervene. My suspension was lifted and I was back at work the next day. The best part? Susan's ridiculous policies were all reviewed and mostly scrapped. She's still with the company, but let's just say her enthusiasm for rulemaking has significantly diminished. So there you have it, folks. Sometimes following the rules a little too closely can be the best form of rebellion. And always, always know your employee handbook. Am I the jerk for not allowing my mother-in-law to come over to my house unannounced? I've been with my husband for three and a half years and married just over one year. This past November, we had our first kid. My husband is an only child and his father was never in the picture. Him and his mom have never really been close. Now for a little backstory. We're both at odds with my mother-in-law and it all started less than 24 hours after I had my son. My husband and I told both my mother-in-law and my mother that we did not want our son's birth turned into a photo op. People taking pictures of me have always made me uncomfortable. My son had some complications immediately after he was born and he was rushed to the NICU. I wasn't able to see him for roughly 9 hours. Once I was allowed to go into the NICU, my husband went with me as this was the first time I was officially meeting my newborn son. Next thing I know, I look up and I see my mother-in-law using this as an opportunity for a photo op. I was fuming. These were not the first pictures I wanted of my son or of my husband and I with our son. The next morning, my mother-in-law decided she wanted to come back and see our son who is now safe and in our room. I'm running on maybe two hours of sleep, but still said it was okay for her to come. Once she was there, I didn't really interact with her. I was just trying to rest. After she left, she ended up calling my husband. This is when he decided to call her out on the photo op and how she completely violated a boundary we had clearly set. Her response floored me. She began yelling at my husband, saying that I hate her, that I don't like her and I never have, that I am so hateful towards her. She said her reasoning for taking the pictures was because she thought that we would want to remember that moment and to her it wasn't a big deal and she didn't see the point in getting upset. Once all of this happened, I decided I needed to distance myself from her and focus on my new family. My husband agreed with doing this as well. Fast forward to about a week and a half ago, my husband and son had been sick for over a week. I was out doing errands and getting groceries. Mother-in-law asked me multiple times if I wanted anything from Sam's Club. I would constantly tell her, no, but thank you. She was doing the same to my husband and he would also respond, no, we're good, thanks. I returned home and my son was screaming. He hadn't slept all day. We decided to try to nap. My husband finally falls asleep and I finally get my son to fall asleep. About 10 minutes later, there's a knock on my door. My dog goes flying and barking her head off, waking up my son. I answer the door and say, why are you here? She says I wanted to bring you a rotisserie chicken, a trash can, and laundry detergent. I told her we already said we didn't want anything and to not show up at our house unannounced and that next time she tries to give us random crap, I will immediately return it to her. We don't want anything from her. She got angry and said she will never come over or speak to us again and slammed the door. Am I the jerk? Not the jerk. This is wrong of me. But the quickest cure for always popping by unannounced guests is to stop answering the door like a knee-jerk response to the bell. I never answer the bell when I'm not expecting anyone, and I almost never casually grab the phone when it rings either, unless I'm at work. I needed a clean circle of get off my dang nerves, so I created one. And yes, I will tell anyone later, sorry I missed you, what did you need? Retrain her just as you would a dog, okay? Give her some homeopathic aversion therapy by not engaging in the endless cycling of your frustration and dramatizing that she's being victimized. Not the jerk, but I wonder if it's worth experimenting with a different approach. You keep telling mother-in-law, please don't do this, and then she keeps doing that very thing. Why? Because she thinks she's being helpful? All she wants to do is help you, so give her stuff to do that scratches that itch and then live your life in peace. Do you need stuff from Sam's Club? No. 
but what we really need is someone to take our dog for a few hours so we can nap uninterrupted. Or, yes, we could really use some orange juice, but our house is a mess and everyone is sleeping. Can you leave it at the door and we'll get it from you tomorrow? My girlfriend pulled an insane prank on me and I'm beyond furious. This happened yesterday. I was expecting my new Mac Pro, which I saved a lot for in the past few months, to arrive. It was nearly $6,000. I was given a delivery window, and of course it was delivered during the window, at a time that I was in the bathroom and I didn't notice. My girlfriend collected the package and hid it, so I was left wondering where the package was. When the delivery window passed, I asked the delivery company and they just said the window is a guideline and asked me to call back in an hour, which I did. And after tens of minutes of being on the phone, they finally told me that they have called the driver and it's already been delivered. I told them that it's not delivered and the driver is either mistaken or lying, which basically started an argument for maybe five minutes where I asked to talk to a supervisor. To make it short, I was on the phone with them for four hours telling them that they have either delivered to the wrong address or that their driver is trying to steal a package. During this time, my girlfriend looked worried and she even started searching online for misdelivered parcels and even posted on Facebook that this had happened. At the end of the day, I was told by the company that they will give me a call the next day to update. I also called Apple and made them look into the situation, and they said that they will investigate. So at almost 7 p.m., after being upset for more than six hours, she brought the package and said that it was all a prank. I was beyond angry, and before I could say anything else, she just said goodbye and left. I'm still angry. I love her, and she's always been very nice, but this whole thing was just messed up. She handed you the package and just said goodbye and left? It doesn't even seem like she got anything positive out of this, including enjoyment, so I can't understand why she would choose to do this. I personally despise pranks, so seeing you go through that willingly is pretty messed up. I'm sorry this happened to you. OP. She started laughing, but when she saw how angry I was, I guess she just decided to call it a day, maybe to avoid an argument. I wonder if she even thought about the delivery person possibly losing their job because of this. Being suspected of stealing a $6,000 item, which is a felony, thereby possibly initiating a police investigation, yeah, I'd have a serious talk with her about actions and consequences. OP, I already have. I've never been this embarrassed in my life. Update. So she apologized to me and explained why she did it. Apparently, she and her sister had a bet to pull the most insane prank on their boyfriends. Her sister put salt in her boyfriend's beer and my girlfriend did what she did, so I guess we know who won. She realized how stupid this was. I also called the delivery company and apologized for everything. Told them that my friends had pranked me without any consideration. They were not happy about it, and they told me that they had suspended the driver until the issue was resolved. So I guess it cost the poor driver a day's pay. I'm gonna let it pass. It's all over now. Are you kidding me? Your girlfriend should have called the delivery company and apologized. And she should pay the driver his day's pay. OP. I honestly called and apologized the next morning out of concern for the driver. She offered to do it, but I had done it already. An innocent delivery driver who had done nothing wrong is suffering from all this and you're gonna let it pass? OP. What else can I do? The delivery company didn't accept a reimbursement offer. Maybe tell her to find the exact driver and apologize for her rudeness, for the trouble she put you and the other guy through. Don't they leave who left the package? OP. I tried getting details of the driver. The company didn't do it and wanted to quote, be done with us. That driver is sitting at home with his wife and kids trying to figure out how they're going to pay their bills for the next month if he gets fired, worrying about being evicted, wondering how they're going to tell their daughter they can't afford ballet this month because daddy might get fired for something he didn't do. I wonder how much he laughed at her prank. Her behavior shows a level of selfishness and inability to think about the consequences of her actions that makes me worry about her as a long-term partner. OP. She said she had not at all considered the consequences for the driver. Otherwise, she wouldn't have done it. She's 28 years old and she couldn't think forward enough to not hurt people? I would seriously reevaluate your relationship and keep an eye on things. If she can't develop more empathy and thoughtfulness for others, if she can't, it'll bite you in the backside again probably at the worst possible time. Am I the jerk for telling my wife that she's entitled and has it too easy? I, 48 male, and my wife, Anne, 47 female, live by ourselves. Our kids have both moved out. 
I'm the breadwinner and Anne the stay-at-home mom. Now she's the housewife after our youngest moved out last year. What's changed is that she says she's owed for raising our kids and taking care of the household. She wants more personal time, less work around the house, and so I've basically taken over almost all of the housework, cooking three meals, cleaning the house. I'm still working a full-time job, and I never slacked on chores that I did, such as gardening, hard lifting, etc., and I was never an absent father. I bore with it for the past year, but she's gotten much worse, outright berating me in front of the kids when they visit that I'm only good for my strength and I don't think about the household at all, while she's doing less of the household work. It's gotten to the point that I just want to relax in the car for a good solid minute because I only know there's a long list of things to do. Last night, she went out with her friends while I slept early for work. This morning, I looked for the car keys for over 30 minutes, which were not in the drawer we always put them in. I woke her up to ask where she put them, and she just grumbled at me to find them myself before going back to sleep. I ended up finding it in her handbag and got to work late. I got home today to her screaming at me for invading her privacy by going through her handbag. I tried to tell her that she told me to go find them myself, but she kept cutting me off, saying I should have known better than to dig through her personal belongings, that she has rights and I should respect them and to wait for her to wake up before getting her to find the keys herself. It was when she said that she didn't care if I was late to work that I lost it. Her exact line was, It's not like we're needing that stupid money anymore. I yelled back at her that she was entitled and selfish, and that the only reason she's able to enjoy her current time is because of my stupid money. That she's been having it far too easy the past year, and if she wanted to see what she's owed, she can go back to either working or doing all the chores she's dumped on me. Anne was shell-shocked that I yelled back at her. The rest of the night was quiet and she locked herself in our bedroom and hasn't come out. I've called our kids and told them what happened. My daughter agrees with me, but my son says that I may have been too harsh to call her entitled and implied that I undermined her efforts all those years as a stay-at-home mom. They're going to take turns calling Anne, but I now wonder if I may have been overboard with yelling at her about taking it too easy. Daughter has suggested couples therapy and said she's going to suggest it to Anne as well. I'm more than willing to do so, as today's encounter made me reflect that I'm getting extremely tired and weary of this life. Not the jerk. Get your affairs in order. If you still love this woman, get counseling. Regardless, start separating money now. A divorce is going to cut you in half. Getting living expenses if she empties your bank account and bails? Pretty darn hard. Get copies of all pertinent documents. Mortgage, passport, savings, car title, insurance. Take control of all of your accounts or at the bare minimum, instruct them that all changes must take both of your presence, not signature. She wouldn't do that. Yes, she would. We have problems, but case A, case B, case C, etc. Expect the best and prepare for the worst. Not the jerk. Your wife sounds messed up. Something is very wrong. This is the time when both of you should be enjoying your life together. Something is wrong. She's either having a midlife crisis or an affair. Find out. She wants a divorce, my dear sir. Get ready to be taken for a ride. Not the jerk. Hire yourself a great attorney and wait for her affair to come out. Alimony will be due, but prepare yourself. Alimony? Maybe for a few years, but most modern countries expect adults to get their life together and start earning an income within five years. A few years is plenty, and surely she's entitled to half of everything else. This woman hasn't worked in forever. Depending on the state, she could be owed until she remarries. Either way, this man needs to get his affairs in order. Not sure, but I want to break up with my partner over the content of his will. So I finally got the courage to discuss this issue, but I'm still very embarrassed because I know that talking about and discussing money is frowned upon, and I agree that I am not entitled to anything I didn't work for. I live by this, and I have since I was 16. Been my provider, even though I come from a stable and well-off family with loving and supportive parents. But being independent has always been priceless to me. I started my company when I was 26, I'm 42 now, and it thrived until lockdown, when it almost went into bankruptcy, but now it makes a good living, but nothing as it did before. For me, besides having to let go great employees and the fear of losing my pride and joy, my company, the monetary side never bothered me because I have made good savings and I always adjust well to situations living within my limits. Why this long intro? Just to paint a picture of why my partner's betrayal is more about trust and love for me than the monetary aspect. 
I haven't succeeded in making people around me understand this, however, because when I told my family that I want to break up with him over his will, they called me the jerk. I'm 42 female, he's 53 male. We've been together since 2009, living together since 2011. We're compatible in everything and the love I have for him is never wavered. We both make a good living and we have since 2015 bought our beautiful penthouse that we love very much. Around the same time, we started to think about the unpleasant things like passing away, etc. And since we are each other's family, we wrote wills that we inherited each other because we thought that the one leaving earlier could be at peace, knowing the other would not have to worry about moving or lowering their standards. At the time, I made two to three times more than him. He was very supportive and loving during lockdown, and he made me feel like I could just sit it out without worrying about contributing to our living just to keep the company afloat. For a year, I didn't take salary, and I used for my savings, but he made the bigger contribution to the household. After lockdown, now, both with the changes in my economy and advancement in his career, he makes double what I make. We discussed our living situation and if we needed to downsize, but we did the math, and honestly, we don't even spend half of what we make, so it's all good. During my Christmas deep cleaning at the apartment, I stumbled upon his new will, made in 2022, where he only leaves me 10% and 10% to his mother, something we already agreed on. The rest goes to his sister and her family. I was shocked because we never talked about this and he never told me. He's still my sole heir besides the 10% we were leaving to our mothers. His sister and her husband fell on hard times due to her getting fired from her high paying job due to gross misconduct and her husband's job being lost due to lockdown and it turned out that they had accumulated lots of debt throughout the years. But by no means are they poor. They just don't have the means they had before. In fact, they're still way more well off than any of my siblings. But never has it occurred to me or my family that they would inherit me the same way I didn't expect to inherit them. I feel nauseous. I want to leave him. I feel betrayed. The thought makes me so hurt. Not only how unfair it is, but how he hid it from me. I love him and I could just ignore this and change my will in secret too to make my much more deserving siblings my heirs and leave him crumbs, but I don't know. My heart is broken. What do you think? He secretly took away the security he promised you and vice versa. If you knew, then you could plan for a better future. He took a coward's way out and it is betrayal. I would feel sick and devastated too. I don't think this is about money. This is about him going behind your back and changing things without your knowledge. So let's get that out of the way. Partner betrayal is very painful because it makes you question the validity of the entire relationship itself. You start asking yourself, what else did he hide? Can I believe in his words and actions moving forward? That feeling of you can depend on your person begins to erode. Once that trust is broken, it's very hard to repair. My sister showed up at my front door after driving across the country to see me. I turned her away. I, 28 female, have always been incredibly close with my sister who's 30. We'll call her Sam. Since we've been kids, we always hung out together, shared friend groups, hobbies, interests, and genuinely liked being around each other. However, she recently got a new girlfriend who's 29, Trisha, and our dynamic has really changed. I don't like Trisha at all. She's not really rude or unpleasant, but I just don't vibe with her and I think she's annoying. I've expressed this to Sam, which resulted in one of our biggest arguments to date. I understand that my opinion doesn't really matter in their relationship, but I just don't enjoy being around Trisha, so Sam and I have seen each other less and less and have been getting into more and more arguments. I recently moved halfway across the country from my job and Sam asked if she could come and visit. I excitedly said yes, as I wanted to show her all the new hiking spots by me and I genuinely wanted to have sister time again. However, she then asked if Trisha could come along as well. I don't really have the space or means of hosting at my new place, and despite Sam saying she would happily sleep on the floor or the couch, I just really didn't want to be on while she was around. I told my sister I really just wanted it to be her and I hanging out and exploring this side of the country, and thus began another argument. Eventually, I told her, either come alone or don't come at all, which I have assumed would put an end to the visitation plans, but later she agreed she would come alone. Fast forward to when she was planning on visiting. I'm getting extra excited and having a whole plan for the week mapped out. Sam texts me when she leaves her place and since I know it's a 15 hour drive, yes she chose to take it straight through 
She would be arriving at my place around 10 p.m. 10 p.m. rolls around and she knocks at my door and I open it to both Sam and Trisha. I didn't even know what to say or do. I was shocked. Both of them looked happy to see me, but I just couldn't understand what happened. Eventually, the anger and embarrassment caught up with me and I refused to let them in. Things got a little heated and frustrating and it resulted in me telling them angrily to find a motel somewhere or drive home. They both chose to get a motel after quite a bit of fighting and yelling, which is where they are right now. My family is furious with me for making them look for a hotel so late at night, even though it's a pretty highly populated area with many options around. I'm quite embarrassed and worked up over this whole thing, but I don't think I made the wrong move considering I set my boundaries pretty clearly. I feel like I might have overreacted as I genuinely don't think Sam or Trisha will ever speak to me again. I just can't believe my entire relationship with my sister has come to such a screeching halt over a girlfriend she's had for just over a year. Am I the jerk? Not the jerk for setting boundaries and sticking to them. Your sister tried to pull a fast one on you and is now paying the price of a hotel room for it. Ultimately, however, you will need to decide if losing your sister is worth it. This relationship may or may not last, but the hurt you just caused will be something she remembers for a long time. If you want her in your life, you need to have a one-on-one -on -one with her and let her know how you felt when she lied about coming alone and also springing someone she knows you're not fond of on you and into your personal space. Ah, uh, I feel like I'm going to get downvoted by the but your boundaries crowd, but here we go. Everyone sucks here. Sam absolutely should not have surprised you by showing up at your door with Trish. She set up a situation ripe for drama and embarrassment for both you and Trish. She's a jerk. That said, I really think refusing a family member entry to your home and making them get a hotel in the middle of the night should be reserved for relationships with a lot of history and drama. In other words, something more than being a bit annoying. I also think it's a bit selfish of you to demand your sister travel across the country to see you but not be allowed to bring her girlfriend. You're essentially saying, use your limited time and money and pay time off only for me, when it's reasonable and even expected that these things would also be shared with the person's significant other. Bottom line, you admit that Trish is not really rude or unpleasant, and yet you were exactly that to Trish and Sam. Is the issue really that you just don't vibe with her girlfriend? Because that seems like a crazy thing to lose your sister over. What if they get married or they stay together forever without marriage? At one point, do you say, oh well, we'll never be sisters again because I don't like the vibes. You're allowed to have boundaries, but your reasoning for not liking her is shaky. Your sister should have kept the trip the way y'all planned it, but you need to go ahead and let her know you've decided that if she dates people and wants to be in your life, then she has to make sure you give final approval on future partners, and once she breaks up with her girlfriend, you'll be ready for her apology and the keys to her life. Am I the jerk for throwing out my husband and my son a few days before Christmas? My husband, who's 41, and I, 38 female, have two kids. Our daughter, Rachel, who's 15, and our son, Tim, who's 13. Since forever, I've been begging my husband to do more around the house, but he continues to be a lazy man-child. He does the bare minimum when I force him to, and that's it. And our son is learning from him. He's not doing his chores, not cleaning up his messes, and expecting his sister to cater to him. Hubby is enabling him and secretly overrules me when I punished him. We had more than one argument because of their laziness. Yesterday I was shopping with Rachel and we met a friend from work and her boyfriend. So I called my husband and asked him and Tim to clean the house ASAP because I'll bring home guests. When we arrived home nearly two hours later, the house was a mess. I never felt so embarrassed in my life. My friend smiled and downplayed it as normal, but I was able to see the look she exchanged with her boyfriend. We chatted for 20 minutes after I cleaned the living room a bit and they left. I finally had enough. I told Hubby and Tim to get out of my house and don't come back until they learn to respect me and be helpful around the house. We had a bad argument and in the end they gave up and left. My son has called me since from the motel where he and Hubby are staying and begged me to let him back in. I told him he can ask me in 2024 and I might consider it. They're banned for Christmas. Family will gather in my house this year and for New Year's Eve. Tim will then return. Hubby, I'm not sure yet. My mom and sister are against this. They think I'm way too harsh, especially to Tim, but I think he needs a serious wake-up call and this is it. And I don't give a hoot about Hubby at this point. Am I the jerk? Edit. The text says clearly Tim will return home. This is just a wake-up call for him. 
Maybe he can even return for Christmas if he promises to do his chores from now on. Quick update. My son called me again. I explained the situation and what I expect from him. He agreed to sign a paper where all his chores will be listed. He also agreed to help his sister with all of her chores until New Year's Eve. I will pick him up tomorrow. Didn't talk with my husband. Update 2. I picked my son up from the hotel in the early morning. He couldn't wait. I apologized for throwing him out, but explained my reasoning to him. He signed the paper and promised to do better from now on. I'm happy to have him back. Hubby tried to talk to me when I picked him up, but I didn't even listen. As for him, he can stay away for a while, and I will have the time to think about our relationship. Just curious, how did you get them to actually leave? Asking for a friend. This is a perfectly reasonable question. I had an ex-boyfriend living in my house. I told him I wanted him to leave, and he just didn't. I had to write up a formal eviction and take it to court. Merry Christmas. Laughing out loud at the lazy slob who wrote, and then deleted, Honestly, if it had been me, no matter how justified you felt or actually were, your next conversation with me would be to tell you to sign the papers. Oh no. Imagine being a lazy deadweight slob and thinking that saying you'll get a divorce is a threat. Throw out the husband and keep the son. There's still a chance you can influence him to be a better human. If left with your husband, that chance is gone. You're a hero to your daughter for sure. Way to take a stand. You're the jerk. Being lazy and not doing chores and being a crappy dad is not okay, but kicking out your 13-year-old son... Also, I hate last-minute events. You can't make a dinner date or friends come over and expect everyone to shift their time. You should plan accordingly. You're the jerk. You kicked your 13-year-old kid out of your house and banned him from Christmas. You're a monster. What kind of mother does that? I completely understand kicking your husband out or you yourself getting separation, but to punish your 13-year-old for that is beyond messed up. You're teaching your daughter that it's acceptable to treat your son like this even though it's your fault he's acting up. Be a better mother. I can't believe you get the privilege of motherhood and so many wonderful women never get to be moms. Laughing out loud, imagine if a man had wrote this story. I decided to have friends over, so texted my wife, telling her and our daughter to get the house spotless before I got home. They failed to do that, so I kicked my wife and daughter out and won't let them attend Christmas. Reddit hypocrisy, as usual. Am I the jerk for telling my brother, if he's going to be late, don't show up? I, 31 female, and my husband, 29 male, got married a week ago. Yay! I spent two years planning my wedding and everything was great except for my brother, who's 36, male, his tardiness with every event that he came to. For context, my brother and I don't get along. We never have. I only invited him for my parents. Also, I was adopted, so he's not biologically related to me. He's always late, and in the past we've had to tell him an event was two hours earlier than it really was, so that he'd be on time. He was late to my high school and college graduations, and he missed me walk both times. When I was sending invitations, I put in an extra note in his that read as follows, I know mom, dad, and I would love for you to attend, but if you're going to be late, don't bother showing up. Your girlfriend and her daughter are welcome to attend with or without you. He called me for the first time in years and lost it on me. I held my ground and said I would still appreciate him coming to the wedding, but I won't allow him to interrupt the ceremony by being late. He then called my parents and yelled at them as well. They said it was my wedding and they stood by my decision. He came to the wedding, but he walked in as I was walking down the aisle and walked past me to his seat. I was horrified and embarrassed and mad. I didn't know exactly what I was feeling in the moment, but it was a mixture of things. After the ceremony, my dad and my biological father, who I've become close with over the years since I met him, both spoke to my brother about how that was inappropriate and rude. My brother didn't care and asked where the bar was. He was forced to leave. Am I the jerk? Why do you still allow him in your life when he's clearly not interested? There's late, and then there's walking down the aisle at a wedding. OP, it's one of the many reasons we don't get along. He blames me for ruining his life when our parents chose to adopt me. My dad is an attorney and heard about my situation when I was six and adopted me. My brother says that I ruined his life. Do your parents know this? OP. No, I never told them. I don't want to feel like they have to choose between their kids. My brother likes to remind me that he's their son and I'm not their daughter. Just some kid that they took pity on, but I never saw it that way. His loss. OP. 
Thank you. He treats me like this, then asks to use my equipment. I own a cattle ranch, when his isn't working. I've never loaned it out because I don't trust it to come back working. He wants to be my brother, but when he wants to use my shooting range or my four-wheeler. I've never let him onto the ranch. He's never even seen my house. My daughter's afraid of him, honestly. Update. As a lot of people in the comments on this original post said, I told my parents everything. How my brother has told me that I ruined his ideal life. How my parents pitied me, and that's the only reason they adopted me. How I'll never be a member of the family, etc. I also told them that if I host any events at my home and ranch, I will be hosting Christmas this year since I have the space for the whole family, biological and adopted. My brother will not be invited. I do not want him in my life anymore. The event at my wedding was the final straw. I'll be civil if we see each other at family functions that I am not hosting, but I will not be in contact with him anymore unless there's an emergency with our parents. My parents support and understand my position. I told them that this is not me making them choose between us and this is just me drawing a line in the sand and setting a boundary. I love my parents. They saved me from a horrible situation and gave me the best life I could have hoped for. If not for them, I wouldn't have my beautiful daughter, wouldn't have met my husband, or have my amazing ranch. My ranch hands, Lloyd in particular, said that if my brother ever attempted to come onto the ranch without my knowledge, they would boot him fast. Of course, his wife and daughter are welcome anytime. I want to thank everyone for the support and kind comments and helping me see that he does not treat me like family and I should stop trying to extend the olive branch since he keeps burning it. Am I the jerk for not putting a stop to my stepdaughter correcting the food the host made? I, 32 female, have been dating a widower with a daughter, Nara, who's 12, for a year. We currently moved to a new city because of my boyfriend's job promotion, I freelance, and we're in the middle of settling down. Nara and I get along very well. Nara plays tennis. Since the move, she's been in the school team and competed a bit. The parents of her teammates often organize some kind of get-together and her father and I tried our best to have her attend most of them. I would say Nara got along well with all of her teammates and I thought the parents were friendly. Last week, the team captain's parents hosted a potluck party at their place. Nara and I brought over some brownies. There really were a lot of different kinds of food. The team captain's father did most of the greeting, telling us his wife was preparing something special for us all. Once everyone was at the party, the wife came out of the kitchen with a special dish, a recipe of a specific country. Now, Nara looks white, but her late mother actually came from that very country. The wife host began to serve everyone and share her recipe and ingredients and how it was not that difficult to make once you substitute the local ingredients and feel free to ask her for tips. At this point, Nara spoke up, saying that the authentic recipe included such and such and how their particular scent and taste added to the whole experience of eating the dish. She said if so many substitutes were used, they might as well call the dish a different name. The wife host looked a little unsettled and told Nara that she and her husband traveled a lot in their youth and she had the dish many times and knew what it was supposed to taste like and the substituted ingredients worked just fine. Nara then said her mom was from the dish's country of origin and she understood that some ingredients were hard to come by but substituting so much turned the dish into something else altogether. During all this, I mostly kept silent. Nara was not being rude, just matter of fact and as this was a matter of her heritage, I thought she could speak up. The host wife spluttered a bit before saying everyone should just go ahead and enjoy her dish, no matter the name. Everyone tried it, though nobody asked for seconds. I personally thought it was a little bland, and there were a lot of leftovers. Nara's team captain later called her, thanking her for putting her annoying stepmom in her place. When my boyfriend came back from his business trip and learned of this, however, he thought I should have reprimanded Nara for being rude to the host. He also had a talk with Nara and she seemed to be sulking a bit, though she was not grounded or anything. Am I the jerk? You're the jerk. Nara was extremely rude. This woman opened up her home and spent time and money to prepare this meal. Nara trashed it before she even ate it. Maybe you and Nara don't realize this, but there are different ways to prepare a cultural dish. Not everyone in a particular culture prepares their food the exact same way. Maybe the dish tastes similarly to the way it was prepared when the hostess ate it during her travels. Your stepdaughter needs to learn graciousness and respect. If I pulled something like this when I was her age, my mom would make me write an apology letter to the mom. Then she would volunteer our family to host the next team get-together and make me do all of the cooking by myself 
so I would learn to have respect for people who invite me into their home and prepare a meal for me. The team captain is also an ungrateful brat. If her stepmom is so annoying, she needs to learn to handle the hosting duties for these gatherings herself. You're the jerk. Not a huge jerk, but still. Being a gracious guest is a skill that everyone should learn. Was your stepdaughter technically right? Probably. But she made the host uncomfortable unnecessarily. I get that it might be a pain point for her, given her mother has passed on, but she was actually being rude. The host wanted to share something with her guests that she obviously was proud of, and your stepdaughter called her out in front of everyone. My boyfriend gives me horrible gifts, and I'm fed up. We've been together since 2019. Our first Christmas together, I got him an Alexa, cancel, with the accessories to make his apartments a smart home. He moved into an apartment around his birthday, so I got him a microwave, toaster, silverware, etc. His most recent birthday, I got him an at-home golf set because he recently became obsessed with golf. It cost more than I expected, but I was happy to give it to him. Our first Christmas together, he gave me a video game and the money he owed me. For my birthday, he got me another video game. My birthday and Christmas are coming up the same day. I bought him a signed Steelers football because that's his favorite NFL team. He just told me the gift he got me, and this might be dramatic, but I had to stop myself from crying. He went on a solo vacation earlier this year, and my birthday present is that he printed the pictures from his vacation and put it in a photo book. This is his gift to everyone, his mom, sisters, brothers, friends, and me. He mentioned it before, and I politely told him I did not want that gift. I actually told him I would hate it, and he laughed it off. I've been telling him since we started dating that I like jewelry, and I would love that as a gift. He tells me he hates going into jewelry stores, and more recently, a couple days ago, said, You already have so much jewelry. Why would I buy you more? At this point, it feels disrespectful. After finding out my gift today, I told him to just not get me anything. It literally feels like he doesn't care about me or my feelings. He calls me materialistic because I like to buy myself things, and I feel like if I tell him how I truly feel, he'll just call me materialistic more. And maybe I am materialistic. Maybe this is a sweet and thoughtful gift, and I ruined it for him. My jaw dropped at the multiple photo books of his vacation. Is this something that people do? Why would I want a coffee table book of someone else's vacation pictures? If someone in my family got us all this gift, they would never live it down. The issue isn't the gifts. The issue is that he makes no effort to do something you would like. He sounds like he's in his own head. This isn't going to change, so it's up to you whether or not you want to be with him long term. Stop buying him sweet and thoughtful gifts. Give him a framed picture of himself. You need to consider if you really want to remain in this relationship. It feels like he doesn't care about you or your feelings because that's what his actions are showing you. I'm sorry. I wish I'd walked away from men like him in the past, and I hope you do too. My boyfriend now gets so excited about buying me gifts on Christmas that he always overdoes it. There's partners out there that will match your efforts if you only make the space for them. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or her boyfriend? Please let us know. Am I the jerk for making my nephew apologize immediately in front of his friends? I, 33 male, am staying at my grandparents' house for the holidays. My grandparents passed away and the house was maintained by their kids, making it a communal space for all family members to use. The rooms are usually saved for those of us who visit from out of town like me. I have a cousin, Frank, who's 34, who also visits but stays elsewhere. We were close growing up. Frank was married to his high school sweetheart, Kim, for around 10 years and they had a 6-year-old daughter. Kim passed in an accident just a little over a year ago. Frank was more than devastated. What set Frank apart from most guys is I know how deeply he loved his wife. He was an exceptionally happily married man. His goodbye phrase to me in private or in public was, See you later, miserable single loser. He was making fun of how I never had a long-time girlfriend. I always took it in good fun. It was nice to see a guy so devoted given that my parents and more than half of my aunts and uncles are divorced. A few days after I stayed at my grandparents, my nephew Tom, who's 17, showed up with a few friends wanting to watch a movie. Tom lives with his sister nearby. I ordered the boys some pizza and I joined them. A bit later, Frank dropped by, wanting to catch up with me. We stayed in the same room and talked. Frank seemed to be doing much better since the last time I saw him a month after Kim's funeral. Once the movie was over, Tom asked if they could hang out in the room for a while and I said yes. 
Frank, however, excused himself, saying he needed to go pick up his daughter. We hugged goodbye, and Frank was about to leave when Tom said, What? None of that miserable single loser stuff? Welcome to the club. Guess now you're a miserable single loser too. I could see the colors drain from Frank's face, and he looked like he was going to pass out. I immediately turned to Tom and told him to apologize, and now. Tom said, why should he apologize, and I only raised my voice with, now. Tom glared at me, but finally looked away and softly said sorry to Frank. Frank just left. Tom's friends mumbled about how they had to go and quickly cleaned up and left. Tom left with them. Later that night, Tom's father called me from across the country, reprimanding me that I should not shame Tom in front of his friends like that. He said he understood what Tom said was insensitive, but being scolded like a kid in front of his friends was not how I should handle this. I could wait and have Tom apologize later. Am I the jerk? No, what you did was absolutely the right thing. Tom needed to be told immediately and in no uncertain terms that what he said was absolutely and completely awful and that he needed to apologize immediately. Tom literally could have walked up to Frank and sucker punched him and it would have hurt Frank less. Not the jerk. If you haven't already, spend some time talking to Tom's dad and make sure he knows what really happened. Tom may have described what happened in a way that made him less of a bad guy. Karen closes down my street so her kids and dogs can play in the road. I live on the end of a cul-de-sac in a newer built neighborhood. I've been here for over five years now. I'm the only person in the cul-de-sac that doesn't have kids as I'm a single female. The mamas usually close off the cul-de-sac every morning, sometimes during the day too when it's nice out, and they allow their kids and dogs to play all over the street and my yard, driveway, and porch. There are eight kids in total ranging from ages one to six. The problem is that this is usually when I'm coming home from work after a long day. The mamas expect me to park on the street and walk to my home and then come back later when they're done and get my car in the garage, and I'm not doing this. There's typically toys and various types of tricycles laying all over the road. The parents and kids are also on the road and nobody will move from my car as I maneuver around all the obstacles. I've installed security cameras and planted barriers around my property to discourage the trespassers. However, they just throw my mulch, ride bikes through my flower beds. Their dogs have urinated so frequently on my plants that they are now deceased, and they defecate in my yard and leave it. The kids have messed up my cars and broken many things, electrical items. Their one-year-old is frequently found on my porch, and I mean multiple times a day. It's only my yard this happens to. However, yesterday was the last straw. I was coming home and the road was closed as usual for their makeshift mommy and me time. I drove around the obstacles and pulled up in my driveway. Two kids, maybe about five or six, ran up in my car between me and the garage door and they held out their hands so I couldn't pull up. They were blocking my path. Yes, they were in my driveway about a foot from my garage door. The mamas see it happen and do nothing. Next thing I know, a mama is running over screaming at me that I'm driving too fast up my driveway. She was referencing how the kids play in the yard in the driveway and I'm putting them in danger and banging her fists on my door. I then woke up this morning to find she had made a large sign that said, no speeding, kids at play, and put it in my yard facing my front door. I did make a call to the police, but they said there's really nothing they can do for neighbor disputes, even though they're trespassing and closing roads. Is this right? How else can I handle this? What would you do? Am I truly in the wrong here? I've spoken to them before, and they've just suggested that I move if I can't be in the village that helps raise the kids. Should I report this? The neighbors all agree that I'm the problem here and they're ganging up on me as they feel I should park and wait and allow the kids to play on my property. I even have security footage of a parent instructing their kid to steal from my property to teach me a lesson because I planted barriers. Call the non-emergency number and ask about road closure rules. This is a major safety issue because emergency vehicles will be impeded by the road closure and all of their stuff on the roads. Also, report all property damage and trespassing. They already can't stand you, so no need to worry about rocking the boat. Tip it over and drench them. Drive up with the most annoying gangsta rap music you can blaring from your car. Give the moms a concert until they move their crap. Teach their kids some new vocabulary words. This is why I live in the country. Neighborhoods just suck, and I don't know why people put up with living there. Houses extremely close to each other, high crime rates, no views of nature, Loud, obnoxious neighbors playing dumb music. Extreme bass rattling your walls when you're trying to sleep. 
kids screaming outside all hours of the day, cars with loud engines and motorcycles, dogs barking nonstop, parties all hours of the night. I'd pick these snakes and coyotes over that mess any day. Most people want to stay in the city so they're closer to their job, but a longer work commute has always seemed worth it to me to save my sanity. Nothing is better than sitting on the back porch in the morning drinking my coffee without another soul in sight as far as the eye can see. This is how we were meant to live. Not in boxes stacked next to each other or on top of one another. How I complied my way out of a parking ticket. A few years ago, I parked in a paid parking lot but forgot to buy a parking ticket. When I came back a few minutes later, I discovered an $80 ticket on my dash. While I was frustrated about my own forgetfulness, the ticket itself was fair. However, I came to discover that the amount they had charged me was not. Before leaving the lot, I noticed a small detail on the terms and conditions sign at the entrance of the lot. It said that a failure to pay for a parking ticket would result in a $70 ticket, not the $80 ticket that I was charged. While I'm no lawyer, I do know that those signs essentially create an implicit contract upon entering the lot. Therefore, the company was technically violating their own contract by charging me extra. I appealed the ticket, stating that I would be happy to pay the agreed upon $70, but it was rejected. I then reached out directly to customer service, explaining the same situation. They rejected my request to pay the valid $70 because their ticket amounts are non-negotiable. Cue the malicious compliance. I realized that by their own words, they are the ones attempting to negotiate the price by charging me an extra $10. So I called up the supervisor of their claims department. She was already aware of this dispute and immediately attempted to shut me down, saying, the signage is not up for discussion. I reminded her that their company's policy states that ticket amounts are non-negotiable and that given what the terms on the sign stated, they were trying to negotiate a higher price. Once again, she shut me down, stating the signage is not up to discussion. The rest of the conversation went something like this. Me. So, where can I escalate this from here? Her. There is no more escalation. Next stage is court. Me. Seems silly to go to court over $10, don't you think? Her. Yeah, it does. Me. Okay. Well, I'll begin the small claims court process over the non-negotiable price issue then. Her. Okay. I was having fun at this point and I was fully ready to start taking legal steps over this $10 on a matter of principle, and knowing that if I did, the company would immediately cave. Before doing that, however, I sent one final email to the vice president of the company. I explained the whole dispute, explained the signage, their non-negotiable policy, and how the appeal supervisor told me my next step was to take it to court. I offered them the opportunity to resolve this civilly before going on to that stage. Not even three hours later, I got an email back, stating that my ticket had been fully cleared as a courtesy. I called their bluff, maliciously complying to the contract and the take it to court attitude and it worked. As an added bit of pettiness, I replied thanking them and CC'd the appeal supervisor. I then directly addressed her, telling her that this is how easy it could have been resolved if she would have just actually addressed the signage issue. The moral of the story, push back against parking lot companies. They use shady practices and try to scare people into paying unjustly. Often a simple but credible legal threat will make any issue disappear. And as some have pointed out, yes, these parking tickets aren't usually enforceable. That being said, if I ever wanted to use this lot again, which is the only one in the area, then I would have to get it resolved, lest I get towed. Also, I can't recall exactly how the appeals woman brought up court, but I don't think she implied that I should sue. I think it was more of a veiled, we will sue you statement, which was of course a bluff. Regardless, as many pointed out, her mentioning court at all was a bad idea on their part. Karen demands a new debit card, gets what she deserves. I work at Wood Forest National Bank. This story happened about a month ago. One of our usual entitled Karen customers comes into the bank demanding that we print her a new debit card because she lost her old one. We issue debit cards same day so long as they pay a debit card fee, $10 for a reprint and $15 for a new card, waived for certain accounts. A reprint was a simple task, so I print her card and send her on her way. She then walks back into the bank because the last two numbers were slightly rubbed off. This is due to how the machine prints the cards and it's pretty common. Karen, I want you to print this card again. Me, is it not working? Karen, look at the last two numbers. Other banks don't give me cards with rubbed off numbers. Me, I'm sorry ma'am, but sometimes that happens with the machine. It rubs off part of the numbers when activating the chip. I don't care. 
It looks terrible. Do it again. Me. Ma'am, I don't think this is a good idea. We really don't have control over the machine. She starts raising her voice. I don't care what you have to do. Just print my card again so it looks nice. She takes a pair of scissors and cuts the card up into tiny pieces right in front of me. Print the card now, or do I have to close my account and contact the market manager? The market manager isn't someone you would know unless you've had a conversation with him before. It's obvious she's trying to name drop him to get me to shut up and comply. Cue malicious compliance. I turn over to my manager and he gives me a nod. I then put on a devious smile and say, Absolutely, ma'am. But to ensure this won't happen again, we will need to change the numbers, so I'm going to need you to sign some things. See? Was that so hard? We then spend the next 10 minutes printing out new cards until we get one that doesn't have the numbers slightly rubbed off. Each time the card isn't to her liking, she cuts it up and says do it again. I just smile and say, sorry about that, let's try again. Each time, until about 8 cards later, she finally gets a card number that isn't rubbed off. Finally, this card looks good, thanks. <laughs> she just leaves with a smug grin, thinking that she won and leaving us with her massive pile of cut up debit cards. What we forgot to remind her is that having a completely new card generated outside of fraud or expiration costs $15 to be deducted from your account. This is made clear at account opening, and since she signed off on having all these new cards printed, there was nothing she could say about it. Normally, I try and help people avoid bank fees, but in this case, forget this Karen. A couple of days later, she comes storming into the bank, looking upset. What did you do to my account? Me. I'm sorry, ma'am. What seems to be the problem? There's a bunch of debit card fees on my account. What did you do? Me. Oh, every time you had me print a new debit card for you the other day, a $15 fee was charged to your account. The first one where you had me reprint the card number was only $10. You need to reverse these fees right now before I call the market manager and get you fired. At this point, my manager steps in. Manager. Hello, ma'am. What's the issue? Your employee tricked me into paying over $100 worth of fees because he kept messing up my debit card. Manager. Ma'am, could you please not yell? Also, I was there. You demanded we print you a new debit card because you didn't like the numbers being rubbed off. We have your signature on these forms stating that you wanted these cards to be printed. I will not be reversing these fees for you. Karen. Then I want you to close my account. Manager. Okay. But first, you need to pay off your negative account balance as well as your line of credit. Just give me the market manager's number. This is insane. Me. Sorry, ma'am, but we aren't at liberty to just give you his number like that. Here's the number to customer service if you'd like it. This is true, as he's instructed us to not give his number out to customers who ask for it. The only people who need his number already have it. She takes the number and screams, I'll have all of your jobs for this, kicks over the chair and storms out. We get a call from customer care later about the incident where we explain everything and scan over all of the signed debit card applications. Also, she had us print 8 brand new cards and the one reprint. That cost her about $130 in fees because she demanded a new debit card. The best part is, my manager likely would have just waived the original $10 fee had she just been nice and asked. Am I the jerk for kicking my maid of honor out of my wedding with 5 days notice? I'm 23 female. I'm getting married in a couple of days. Most of this happened in the last two weeks. My maid of honor, who's 26, Mara, was in charge of planning my bachelorette party, which I wanted to be a surprise. We live in a city, but none of us live downtown, so I was hoping for a hotel room downtown and having a fun night out with friends, maybe a brunch. Most of the bridal party lives locally, but two girls flew in for it. When Mara picked me up two weeks ago on Friday, I was excited to see where we were going and what we were doing. We ended up going to Mara's one-bedroom townhome and spent the whole weekend there. There are eight of us, so it was cramped and we kept running into issues with only one bathroom. On Friday night, we had games and ordered pizza. Saturday, we had a mimosa bar, went shopping, ordered food, and watched a movie before parting ways on Sunday. It wasn't the bachelorette party of my dreams or a particularly fun weekend, but it was okay and I appreciated it. Last weekend, my fiancé, who's 32, James, had just returned from a work trip. I hadn't caught him up to speed on the party because there wasn't much to report. But when he returned, we were chatting and I told him about the party. He looked confused but said nothing else that evening. 
The next day, I got a message from Mara asking to meet up to talk about something. Mara revealed that James had given her a significant amount of money over a year ago with the intention that it was used to be paid for the bachelorette party. It would have been enough to pay for the entire bridal party to do a week-long vacation out of town, including airfare, hotel, food, drinks, and fun. I wasn't expecting this type of an event. A weekend downtown would have been wonderful, and even though the party at her home wasn't what I had hoped for, I was fine with it because I got to be with all of my friends. She, instead, used that money to pay off her credit card debt and hoped that no one would notice. I told her I needed some time to process this and I went home. After talking with James about it, I decided that the best action would be to remove her from the wedding. I came to this decision because I don't feel I can trust her and I don't want her to be standing next to me at my wedding. I slept on it overnight and sent her a text saying this on Monday. Since then, I've been getting texts from her mom and boyfriend telling me how awful I am for doing this since I didn't need a big party and Mara was able to financially benefit. My mom is also against removing her from the wedding as she's like a sister to our family and it would be tragic for me to get married without Mara there. The rest of the bridal party is split with half saying I shouldn't have kicked her out and the other half agreeing with me. Mara has been crying because she already has her dress. James and I paid for all of the dresses and she can't wear it anywhere else. At this point, I want the wedding to be over so I can be on my honeymoon and not having to deal with these people. So, was my action too extreme? Am I the jerk? Do these people not realize that she stole your fiancé's money? OP. People realize it, but the prevailing sentiment is, in the case of my bridal party, they don't particularly care, and her mom feels it's okay because it got her out of debt. My mom is just disregarding the entire situation because she cares about Mara. She obviously knew it was wrong because she told you out of guilt. OP, she didn't tell me out of guilt. After he found out what my bachelorette party was, my fiancé told her either she needed to sit down and tell me or he would. Depending on the amount, you could totally press charges. OP, neither me nor James are interested in dragging this out in court or pressing charges. He wouldn't have given her more money for a bachelorette than he could afford and this situation is not worth the amount of emotional turmoil that would put everyone involved. We've got enough backlash for removing her from the wedding. And the bombshell. The amount stolen. $25,000. Are you guys insanely rich? How do you brush off $25,000? OP. My fiancé makes significantly more money than me and my friends, as well as our families do. Did you tell the others how much she stole? Because that could have helped them too. OP. I haven't disclosed the amount to anyone yet. I'm probably going to send a text out tonight with that information and stating that anyone who feels she was justified is free to not attend on Saturday. Why in the world did your fiancé give her that money a year ago? OP, I think he gave it to her under the assumption that a week-long party would take a while to plan, and that way she could start booking things that may have limited space as well as dispersing money to coordinate flights. She's a person who's been in my life since I was 18 and typically comes over to our house at least once a week. My fiancé considered her a close and trusted friend as well. It's technically my fiancé's money, even if it was for what was supposed to be a gift for me. He's leaving it up to me if I want to press charges, and has let me know that he'll support whatever route I want to go. I'm still kind of in shock and obviously upset, so pressing charges or taking her to civil court is the last thing on my mind. He does have text messages confirming that she received it and what it was for, and she has sent me things confirming that she used it to pay off debt and her mom and boyfriend have as well. Maybe I'll change my mind later on, but right now I just want to get married and get away from the drama. Update. To answer the most pressing question, I removed her from the wedding and I disinvited those who continued to support her after I shared the amount that she stole. My husband and I had a lovely wedding and honeymoon, and when we got back, we got in contact with his lawyer to begin compiling information and preparing to file a civil suit. This is still in the early stages, but as so many did point out, we do have a responsibility to ensure she faces some kind of consequences to prevent this from happening to someone else. While we won't be pressing criminal charges, we'll cooperate with law enforcement should the DA wish to bring charges after information is brought forth in our civil suit. I honestly don't believe my ex-friend has the money to repay us, but we will be donating anything we receive from the trial. $25,000 for a bachelorette weekend? Time to log off of Reddit before I stare at my bank account and wonder what it's like not to sneeze at $25,000. Thinking about it, 
It's so out of touch of the groom to think it'll be problem-free to hand a normal person or a broke person $25,000 for the party as though it's petty cash. For most, that's a life-changing sum, and being told to spend it all on one chick's party is soul-destroying. Well, what do you think? Should OP have forgiven her friend or not? Please let us know. No way, she's a total thief. Am I the jerk for telling my uncle that I would never be a stepmom after seeing how his daughter treated my aunt? When I, 20, female, was 7 years old, I lost my parents and was sent to live with my aunt, biological, and her husband, uncle, and his daughter, Kylie. Kylie was 10 when I moved in. She lost her mom when she was 5 or 6 and my aunt had been married to my uncle for a little over a year, so it was a really difficult time for her. But I remember thinking, Kylie might get what it was like a little. But she was very clear from day one, we were not family. One thing that always stuck out to me was how Kylie really resented and hated my aunt. My aunt couldn't ask Kylie to do anything without being yelled at. She couldn't do anything nice for her without getting glared at. She'd accuse her of disrespecting her mom by trying to play mom. She'd accuse her of doing stuff that she had no right to do. She'd tell my aunt to know her place. My aunt always understood Kylie was grieving and she pushed my uncle to make sure Kylie got enough time with him but was also able to talk to him. They had her in therapy as well. My aunt told me once when I got upset on her behalf that some people, kids or adults, can find it hard to see their living parent move on and have a new relationship after they lose the other parent and Kylie was struggling. A few months ago I saw Kylie for the first time in 12 years and she could not hide her still existing hatred for my aunt. The way she looked at her, I even heard her tell my uncle that my aunt was nothing to her and all she did was attempt to steal a deceased woman's entire family. It made me realize just how strong that resentment can be. I also know from my uncle's sister that Kylie is still furious my aunt ever tried to ask her to do anything or issued any kind of consequence for her behavior when she was a kid. The experience of living with them always made me say I didn't see myself ever wanting to date and marry someone who has kids. But having seen her hatred for my aunt at 30, knowing she still resents my aunt for even daring to ask her to do something in the home, it made me realize that while it can work and some people have amazing blended families, it's definitely not for me. A few days ago I came home for Christmas, staying until the 28th. My uncle was talking about my boyfriend and then asked me about this guy at work who asked me out a couple of times and why I never gave him a chance since I thought he was cute, etc. I told him it just wouldn't work but he kept pushing and I told him it was because he had kids. He told me that was a strange reason when I want kids and I said yeah, but after seeing how Kylie treated my aunt, I've decided I would never be a stepmom. My uncle was upset about it and told me I can't swear off men with kids for that reason and he said divorced and widowed parents deserve to find happiness again. I said they do and I would never say they shouldn't have that, but I do not want to be that for them. He said it was rude for me to blame Kylie. Am I the jerk? Not the jerk. He's right. Widows and widowers do deserve happiness and to find someone if they choose. However, it is your life. I wouldn't want to date anyone with kids either. Now, that might change when I'm older. I'm only 24 now. Your opinion is valid regardless of your experience. Having kids and dating is hard. Babysitters, school, parenting, etc. There are a lot more variables than there are now to introduce and it's complicated. Also, if I was in that position, I wouldn't want to start seriously seeing someone unless my kid really liked them. How the heck do you navigate that? You don't want to introduce them too early and have one party get attached and it doesn't work out. You don't want to introduce them too late and make your kid or partner feel like you're hiding them. And what happens if they don't get along? Stay in the relationship and risk your kid feeling like you aren't on their team anymore? He took what you said personally, when in actuality it had nothing to do with him. Am I the jerk for not buying my son a car like I did for the rest of his siblings? I, 49 male, have four kids, twin boys who are both 27, one girl who's 25, and another son who's 21. This post is about my youngest son, Jack. Since they were kids, I promised my kids two things. One, I'll fully pay for all of their college expenses, housing, tuition, food, etc. And two, once they graduate college, I'll buy them a car. I kept that promise for all of my kids, except with Jack and now I want to know if I'm being a jerk for this. I paid for Jack's college expenses, but I'm refusing to buy him a car. Below are some of the reasons why. 1. I co-signed my name on the lease for Jack's room that he rents with a friend, and I send Jack his portion of the rent every month. 
The friends started taking advantage of my name being on the lease and stopped paying for rent too, knowing I'll cover the amount because I don't want missed payments on my credit score. I asked Jack multiple times to ask his roommate to pay his portion, but the boy did not care to even respond to me and I ended up paying for six months of his friend's rent too until I finally solved the problem by getting my name off the lease. 2. Jack has a very rude and entitled attitude. He speaks to us like we are his low-performing employees. The only time he contacts us is when he wants money and goes no contact otherwise, and we don't know what we ever did to him to make him treat us this way. 3. Last year when my wife had to be hospitalized, all of my kids flew back home to be there for their mother. Jack didn't want to, but one of his siblings bought him a plane ticket and talked him into flying out. Instead of being glad to be beside his very sick mother at the hospital, he spent the entire visit making everyone run errands for him. His sister has to cook a specific type of meal for him. We had to drive him to the gym at a very specific time he demanded and acted like it was one huge inconvenience for him to have to fly out. I even talked to my other kids about whether we were bad parents and that caused Jack to act this way, but all my other kids don't know why he ended up so entitled and spoiled. The rest of my kids are extremely different from Jack. We all get along with each other and care about one another. For the rest of my kids, I spent maybe $100,000 on each kid's total college expenses. With Jack's careless spending habits and unwillingness to save us any money, Jack's college years cost me a total of $180,000. So I refused to buy the promised car. Jack's upset and has gone to his grandparents complaining about me. My mother-in-law already hates me and now she's calling me a jerk saying that I'm playing favorites because I bought everyone a car and not Jack. Not the jerk. If I were being petty, I'd buy a junk or used car for him. If he wants to be so technical about holding you to a promise, well, that's his car. Tell him the rest of the budget was eaten up by the $80,000. Tell him to learn the consequences of his actions. Not the jerk. For people saying that you raised Jack to be that way, they're completely ignoring the fact that we're human beings and not robots. At some point, personalities start to factor in. My family situation is similar to yours, and I think during the teenage years, adjustments had to be made to accommodate the different personalities in order to set us up for success. My brother and I did not respond to the same treatment, and we received different privileges accordingly. My family would have given me the receipts and bills for my expenses if I acted that entitled. Perhaps that may be what Jack needs instead of a car to help him get a clue. Everyone sucks here. You raised a spoiled brat, and while you're not obligated to buy him a car, you should have forewarned him that dealing with the rent issues meant no car. Am I the jerk for not forcing my stepdaughter to go over to her mother's house? My husband, Tim, 34 male, and I, 33 female, have been married for three years. Tim has a daughter, Lucy, who's 13. Both Tim and Lucy's mother, Deborah, were teenagers when Lucy was born. Deborah wanted nothing to do with Lucy and disappeared, so Tim had full custody and he's been raising Lucy as a single dad when we met. I've been in Lucy's life since she was six and I consider her my own. A couple of years ago, Deborah suddenly appeared back in our lives and contacted Tim wanting to meet with Lucy. Deborah was an addict. I'm not sure if she still is, but I wouldn't be surprised, and generally not a great person for a kid to be around, but Tim would allow Lucy to see Deborah once in a while. Lucy seems like she is just going through the motions with finally having her mother in her life. She doesn't particularly seem excited or upset, she just does as she's told. Deborah also has a boyfriend, Don. Recently, after Lucy came back home from dinner with Deborah and Don, she mentioned to Tim and I that she found Don very weird. He didn't explicitly say anything to Lucy, but she felt uncomfortable being around him. A few days ago, Tim had to unexpectedly go on a work trip to another country where he will be completely unavailable for three days. He won't have any type of service to communicate with us. That trip also happens to coincide on the same time as when Tim and Deborah agreed that Lucy can spend a night at Deborah's. So I was the one dropping Lucy off at Deborah's, and when we got there, we saw Don sitting on the front porch staring at the car. I looked at Lucy, seeing if she still wanted to even go in, and by the look on her face, I asked her if she wanted to go get ice cream at Downtown Disney instead. We live near Disneyland and downtown Disney is in the shopping area right outside the park. She immediately said yes, so I got out of the car and told Deborah that Lucy doesn't want to go to dinner anymore and I'm taking her to downtown Disney for ice cream. Deborah started screaming at me, saying I'm a nobody, trying to bribe her daughter with ice cream so she doesn't want to spend dinner with her own mother anymore. I told her Lucy doesn't want to go in and I won't force her to. 
Deborah responded that Tim had agreed to Lucy spending the night at her place and the matter is between her and Tim. I shouldn't be involved or make decisions because I'm not Lucy's mother. That made me really mad, so I hopped back in my car and drove Lucy to downtown Disney. We actually ended up going to Disneyland as well for the rest of the day. Deborah has been spamming my phone, calling me all sorts of names for not forcing Lucy to stay at her place, and Tim is still unavailable and can't be reached for a comment. I genuinely don't think I was being a jerk, but I need some second opinions. Not the jerk. You listened to what your stepdaughter wanted to do. Hopefully when you explain the full situation to Tim, he understands. I would ask Lucy to tell him herself why she didn't want to go there. Then Tim can have a conversation with Deborah himself. He will need to be the one to have the chat with her. You did the right thing. My boyfriend demands I wear an ugly sweater to Christmas dinner with his family. My boyfriend and I have been dating for a few months and he invited me to meet his family for the first time for Christmas dinner. According to him, it's his brother's, he has three, family tradition to make new partners wear an ugly Christmas sweater of their choosing as a rite of passage, his words, for entering the family. At first, I thought the concept was cute. I had imagined things like Santa getting stuck in a chimney, lights, bells, etc. But when they mailed me the sweater, my jaw dropped. It was probably the most inappropriate Christmas sweater I've ever seen. Without getting too much into detail, let's just say that Santa was participating in an act that was not okay to be seen in public. I personally thought it was gross, and it was bad enough that if someone at work saw me wearing it, I'd definitely get in trouble. I told my boyfriend that in no way would I wear this, but he said I was being a wet blanket and unsupportive of his family tradition. I said I'd wear any other sweater and would even pay for one myself, but he just called me a spoil sport. I do love my boyfriend, so I actually considered wearing it and asking people to not take pictures as a compromise, but the day of the party, I decided not to wear it last minute. I had to drive separately from work, so my boyfriend didn't know about this prior. When his brother opened the door, he eyed me up and down, and I could tell he wasn't happy that I didn't wear the sweater. My boyfriend was really upset when he saw me, and we argued in the guest room for a bit. His brothers teased me for being so uptight, and I could tell the jokes embarrassed my boyfriend. I ended up leaving the party early without my boyfriend, and we've been fighting via text since. Now, I'm thinking that I was the jerk for taking the joke too seriously. Not the jerk. I honestly thought by the title it was one of those cheesy ugly sweaters, but it seems like it wasn't that. It also seems like they want to turn you into the butt of a joke for the evening. Also, I'm guessing none of the males wore ugly sweaters either. Not the jerk. Ugly sweaters are one thing. Crude sweaters meant as hazing are another thing. That your boyfriend supported the sweater should be a little concerning. Honestly, if a family has a habit of hazing new partners, the best thing you can do for yourself is to set proper expectations immediately and not play along. Starting out with them in a compliant, don't rock the boat attitude is just kicking the can down the road. If they're testing your threshold for compliance and mistreatment, then non-compliance is key. If they're just mean people who are more concerned with their own hilarity, eye roll, than they are with making a guest feel welcome, then again, you're telling them right up front to leave you out of it. Not the jerk. And depending on your boyfriend's willingness to protect you now, in the beginning, when you're still in the honeymoon phase and everyone is on their best behavior, really take a long hard look at this family's dynamics. With the expectation that the first year or two are when everyone's putting their best foot forward, the inference is that it's all downhill from here. Are you really looking down the road and seeing a good outcome here? Update. I really appreciate everyone who took the time to message me. After reading your comments, I really thought long and hard about my boyfriend's family and whether or not I wanted to be with a partner who wouldn't respect my boundaries. We got into one final fight when he nagged me to apologize to his brothers all separately. I told him that if he wore the sweater they bought me to our friends miss party, about 15 to 20 attendees, then I'd apologize. He immediately freaked out and said no and tried to argue that they wouldn't understand because it's not their tradition. I explained that it had nothing to do with tradition, but rather with my personal comfort level and whether or not the sweater was an appropriate article of clothing. I asked him why he felt uncomfortable wearing the sweater in front of friends and he refused to answer. He froze up and that's when I realized it wasn't going to work out. He knew that it was inappropriate and he himself refused to wear it in public, yet he was too stubborn to apologize and be on my side. I told him it wasn't going to work out, so I guess I'm going into the new year single as a Pringle. A few friends found out about the breakup already 
and this might have made me a jerk for now, but I sent them the photo of the sweater and explained what happened. I'm also glad to know that even people in real life were grossed out. I don't know what will happen with his friendships with those people, but it's none of my business at this point. Thanks guys, and happy holidays. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or her boyfriend and his family? Please let us know. Good job, OP. Now that's what you call dodging a bullet. A Christmas bullet. Am I the jerk for upstaging my wife and our Christmas cookie baking tradition? I'm 25 male and my wife is 23 female. And we have a tradition every Christmas where we would bake Christmas cookies and frost them with our friends. We would then give the cookies out to friends and family and helpers. Every year, my wife would take on the bulk of the baking duties insisting that only she knew how to bake them right and only letting whoever is helping frost them. She always insisted on doing all the baking because frosting is the fun part and the only thing people want to do. Usually this frosting and baking marathon would last until the wee hours of the morning and start around noon. Well, this year, for reasons that aren't relevant to this post today, she won't be available on the day we normally do all of this. She was sad that we wouldn't be able to do our cooking tradition. I said that I was more than capable of baking the cookies. She seemed to think I was joking and that I could basically never do it myself. Well, I said I'd try and she wished me a sarcastic good luck. Well, in the run up to the days of baking and frosting, I started running drills to optimize production. I started rearranging the house in various configurations, running tests on the dough we were using to see how long it took to bake and making appropriate changes while running it by taste testers substituting ingredients for quicker bake time while preserving taste, making the cookies as thin as possible without compromising frosting ratio, canvas space for creativity, and or comprising structural integrity, etc. Come the day of baking, I have everything down to a science, and friends and family come in, I give them the rundown. After a couple hours, most kinks are worked out and cookies are flowing out at a breakneck pace. Eventually, we start running out of material something that never happened when my wife was running it. We start making runs to the store for the necessary raw materials to fuel our mighty cookie forges. By the time we were exhausted around 2 a.m., we had produced at least five times the amount of cookies we ever had before. Well, my wife gets home a couple days later and is weirdly upset. She insists the cookies taste weird, that we spent too much money, and that I was actively trying to make her look bad by making so much more than her. In truth, I ran blind tests to see if anyone could differentiate between our old recipe and mine, and no one could. I also only spent 40% more than previous years as I slotted in some cheaper ingredients and bought some stuff in bulk, and I had absolutely zero intention of upstaging her. I simply had the goal of maximizing cookie production. She says that even if I didn't do it on purpose, that I should have thought about how it made her look to our circles, and that I have embarrassed her, and she actually called me a jerk. She's never called me a jerk in all three years of our marriage, so I can't help but think I am. Am I the jerk? I don't know if you're the jerk, but it sounds like you took something she enjoys and was sad about missing and did it without her. I would be sad if someone did that to me personally. Edited to add my vote, not the jerk. To me, it sounds like she didn't think he could do it, or even better than her. Also, it's a tradition. Why do they have to stop because one person is missing for that year? She liked baking and basically gatekeeping it from others. He didn't do anything wrong with taking it over and trying at it for one time that his wife couldn't do it. Not the jerk. If it's a tradition you do together, then yeah, you don't do it on your own. My husband and I apple pick and strawberry pick together every year. I couldn't see myself going alone. It's a tradition that we do it together. I'd be hurt if he went without me. Not the jerk. You didn't do anything wrong per se, and your methods sound fun and add a competitive edge which enhances the excitement for some people. But no one likes to discover that a tradition on which they've spent time and effort and enjoy doing doesn't need them at all to function and may even be better without their hard work. Maybe consider telling your wife how much you and your friends missed her at this year's event and that you'd rather have her and less cookies than so many more cookies without her. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or his wife? Please let us know. So sensitive, so sensitive. I can't believe she's making a big deal of this. Blind me in traffic with your high beams? Okay, two can play this game. I was driving home from work and traffic was backed up pretty badly for a few miles. It was stop and go. When I get stuck in that, I'll usually back about 75 feet off the car in front of me 
so that I can hold a pace and move at a slow but constant roll, like the semi-trucks do. This way, I'm not participating in the bumper-to-bumper -bumper move and brake like the rest of the smooth brain drivers. Some dude in an Acura crossover was behind me, and I guess he was getting upset because I wasn't two feet from the car in front of me, driving like a smooth brain. So he gets up on me and starts beeping his horn at me. I think to myself that it's funny as I turn up my radio. But then he starts flashing his brights at me, which is where I get annoyed. He's in one of those Acuras that has a super bright LED headlight. My car is much lower than his, so his low beams are already pretty bright in my mirrors. Bright enough that I don't want to look in them. The first time he flashed his high beams, it put spots in my vision for a moment. It genuinely hurt my eyes. After the first flash, he waited for about 10 seconds, beeps his horn, and then flashes again. Now I'm getting upset. I'm thinking, where do you want me to go? Do you really think being two feet from the car in front of you will make traffic move faster? Then he does it a third time, but this time he held them on for about 15 seconds. Time for the gloves to come off. During those 15 seconds, as I'm looking away from my mirrors, I see my 14,000 lumen searchlight sitting in my passenger seat, at which point I'm immediately overcome by a wave of chaotic, lawful excitement that he has just set in motion and cannot be stopped. I think to myself, oh buddy, you just opened the wrong can of worms. You're going to learn today. I grab the flashlight and set it to its absolute max, 14,000 lumen brightness setting. The flashlight has a sensor in it to automatically dim the light if facing down on a table, because otherwise the diodes would get so hot they would melt the lens. The 14,000 lumen setting is so intense, the 57 watt hour battery can only hold it for 180 seconds before the flashlight automatically notches down to a measly 9,500 lumens. During those 180 seconds, the light will burn through 15% of its battery power. For reference on just how bright this is, the literal sun emits a luminosity of 11,000 lumens per square foot on a bright and clear day. I turn it around and aim it straight at the back of my rear window. My car is pretty noisy, so before I turn it on, I rev up my engine to make sure that he's facing directly towards me when I flash the full force of an afternoon sun at him. I hit the power button and can only imagine the freight train of shock and pain that plowed over him. It was so bright, his automatic headlights shut off because the car thought it was daytime. With the lights on, I could see him clear as glass through his tinted windshield. He was covering his eyes and looking down, probably screaming. I watched him try to flip down his sun visor, but his hand couldn't find it, as I thought to myself, burn, you jerk. I imagine my facial expression was similar to that of a five or a six-year-old roasting insects with a magnifying glass on a bright summer day. After about five seconds of blinding light, I took mercy and shut it off. He proceeded to back way the heck off, and move over to a different lane. Was this an unsafe thing for me to do? Absolutely. Was this illegal? Almost certainly. Was it warranted? Without question. Possibly the highlight of my year. Drive safe and don't be a jerk to the car in front of you, because they might just have the tools to teach you a lesson. Am I the jerk for sulking during my birthday trip that my boyfriend's parents hijacked? There's a lot to unpack here, but I've done my best to keep it to the essentials. In preparation for my 20-something female birthday that recently passed, my boyfriend, who's also in his 20s, male, booked an overseas trip. It was a surprise, so I left everything to him. A month before the trip, he informed me that his parents, who are in their 50s, would be tagging along. This was unexpected to me. I was uncomfortable, but the booking had already been made. I probably asked if we were sleeping in separate rooms, and he replied no due to financial constraints. Fair but I later forgot that I asked. He did assure me that his parents would have separate activities and we would have alone time. The trip came around, a three-day, two-night trip. Day one, while in transit, I asked why the arrangement. He disclosed to me that his mother had made a big fuss when she found out about this trip. He had been traveling with me a lot and she was upset that he hadn't been making time for his parents. On the basis that her birthday falls on the same week as mine, surprise, she insisted on joining the trip, so how could her only son say no? I did not take this new information well emotionally, especially because I don't like his mother to begin with. Also the fact that this was straight up an emotionally manipulative move. We check into accommodations and I realize we're sharing one room. We have no privacy. We have virtually no alone time together on the first day. I sleep conflicted. Day two was where it got really bad. 
I woke up on the wrong side of the bed and with a flu. I was mentally spiraling, thinking how dare his mother impinge on a trip for me like this. I was close to crying and I couldn't even tell my boyfriend or cry. Naturally, I had zero interest in entertaining his parents. Later, I was told that I was frowning the entire day, unreceptive, disengaged, and when his mother spoke to me, I replied to her brusquely and avoided eye contact. I avoided conversations and slept whenever I could in the car. Day 3 and until now. The trip ended and I felt more liberated than anything else. A few days later, my boyfriend informs me that his mother was very offended by my actions on day 2 and she thinks I'm a brat who can't respect her elders. She doesn't want to see me for the time being. Oh no, I think. How tragic. God, how little I care. To be fair, his parents had done nothing to offend me during the trip. They did not impose on me any expectations or rules, and I would even say that his mother was accommodating and kind to me throughout. That's the one thing that makes me feel mildly bad. But in my opinion, they should never have made what was my birthday trip into a family trip. I regret acting so childishly, and perhaps I should have dealt with it better. But I am not apologetic for my feelings. Maybe she didn't deserve it, but she shouldn't have come. And maybe my behavior during the trip was because I wanted to punish everyone, scorched earth style. Am I the jerk? Not the jerk. Dear Lord, this whole thing is the biggest red flag of all time. Run now or start mentally preparing for them to tag along on your honeymoon. Not the jerk. Seriously, your birthday trip with your boyfriend turned into a family vacation, sharing a single room with his parents and you were not feeling well and you're supposed to entertain them? Oh no, it was your trip and you were there for you, not them. You need to ask yourself if you want this type of crap happening all the time because your boyfriend needs to grow a spine and boundaries with his mother or you need a new boyfriend because if one of the two don't happen, you're going to be putting up with this for the rest of your life. Am I the jerk for not inviting my sister to Christmas for disrespecting my family's beliefs? I, 36 female, and my husband who's 35, host Christmas for the family every year. My family is Christian Church of England. None of us are the type to force our beliefs on anyone else. Other people have different beliefs, and it's incredibly rude and pointless to disregard that. However, my sister, who's 32, is an atheist and doesn't want religion to be a part of her family's life. We sometimes bicker about this as she doesn't want me to do things in front of them, like say grace. She gets annoyed at me for doing that in front of her kids, despite the fact that I never ask them to join in with me. This is any time I might be eating a meal when she's present. It could be at a restaurant, it could be at a third party's home, it could be in my own home. When I say grace at her home, it's in my head, although I still bow my head and I hold my hands together as usual. When I say grace during any of the other occasions, it's the same as how I always do it quietly and for myself, not anyone else in the room. Anyway, Christmas is a very important event for my family, and my husband and I always host it as we have the biggest house, so we can accommodate all of the guests. My family always stays over for the week surrounding because I don't live near any of them. My sister was previously always invited, and she'd get her in the afternoon with her kids, after we had all been to church, for the present giving and receiving, and then she'd stay for Christmas dinner. However, she always has a problem with everyone saying grace or singing Christmas carols together. She says she feels forced to participate and that we're influencing her kids, despite her making it clear that she doesn't want them being involved in any of this. Last year, when she put up a fuss about it, it was more intense than usual, and she said that we're all idiots for believing in this rubbish and that we always ruin Christmas. I told her not to attend events like this if she's so against it and to stay home and practice whatever tradition she wants to. She said she goes to Christmas every year because she wants to see the family, but more that she doesn't know how to refuse the invite. So I said that next year, which is now this year, she won't be getting an invite, so there shouldn't be a problem. I stuck to my word and she isn't invited this year. She called me a jerk for blocking her out from the family. Everyone is perfectly respectful of her beliefs, but she isn't of ours. So I don't want her there at this time, which is important to our beliefs. I think that's fair, but am I the jerk? Why not practice what you're preaching? You don't seem to be keeping your own beliefs to yourself. Everyone sucks here, and I'd sure love to hear her side of things. I have a feeling her being an atheist just bothers you a lot, and there's more to it than you're saying. I'm an atheist, and if I went to someone's house and they prayed, I'd just sit there and be silent. I don't say amen, and they don't call me out. You're the jerk. Your imaginary friend isn't more important than family. If you start to say grace in my house, I will remove you.
Everyone sucks here. You get annoyed about her not keeping her belief to herself when she visits you. But still, you don't keep your beliefs to yourself when visiting her. Why don't you guys just enjoy the Christmas for what it really is? A time to be together with your family and enjoy each other. Christmas is a time of peace and enjoyment. Ah, religion. Destroying relationships since day one. You're the jerk, a typical religious jerk. The silver lining here is that she can use you as an example to her kids of the sort of person they don't want to grow up to be like. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or her sister? Please let us know. My question is, will she have a problem with us watching Home Alone or listening to Jackson 5 Christmas album? If she's against those traditions as well, I'm permanently banning her from the house. I think my husband is cheating on me with the babysitter. I'm still trying to process this in my mind while typing it out. Husband and I have been together for six years and married for four. We have two kids, a two-year-old and a four-year-old. Both of us work full-time. I'm a realtor and my husband owns his own business. We've had a number of different nannies in the past. Sometimes our parents end up watching the kids. About eight months ago, my husband told me that one of his friend's daughters, we'll call her Ella, she's 20, was looking for a part-time job during college. We live in a small college town, so her commute wouldn't be far. We tried her out one night and it went smoothly. She's always been nice to me and the kids love her. My suspicions started last month when I came home early to find my husband had been home. Ella was also at the house babysitting. I asked my husband why he didn't send her home if he was home. His response was, she's just trying to make a little money and the kids were having fun. Then two weeks ago, I drove by my husband's office on the way to a meeting and her car was parked there. I asked my husband later about what Ella was doing at the office. He said that she probably stopped by to see her dad. Now when I come home, Ella is always dressed up with more makeup done and high heels on. Two days ago, I found strands of blonde hair in the back seat of my husband's truck. I have blonde hair, but this was closer to Ella's shade. Also, I don't think my husband would do anything in the back seat since he's 6'6 six six and 240 pounds. Last night, I found the opportunity to check my husband's phone while he was with the kids. I didn't find any romantic text between him and Ella, but I could definitely tell that the text messages had been deleted. If you read the conversation, it didn't make sense because it was obviously missing the middle part. I talked to my friend this morning and she pointed out that my husband has a type, blonde women. Ella falls perfectly in that category. Should I confront him right now or should I wait to find something more concrete? Update. Nanny is currently at the house right now. Tracked husband using Find My iPhone and he's also headed home. 30 minute drive. They both think I'll be working until 7 p.m. today. I'm going to walk into the house 15 minutes after my husband gets home unannounced. Not sure what the plan is if I catch them. I unfortunately don't have access to his phone logs since his phone plan is through his business. We have cameras on the outside of the house. We have a baby monitor near the kids' room. I'm not ready to fire her unless I get solid evidence of my husband's cheating. I need to know if my husband is having any sort of romantic relationship with her first. Update 2. I wasn't able to get the concrete evidence I was looking for, but some more circumstantial evidence. Tracked husband through Find My iPhone. He stopped on his way home at the grocery store for 10 minutes. I decided to park and wait on a side street. That way, I could see when my husband would get home. Husband got home at 5.30 p.m. Ella was scheduled to work until 6 p.m. We have a long gravel driveway that leads to our house. I decided to park near the barn so I wouldn't be heard pulling up to the house. Walked in through the front door and found Ella feeding my four-year-old. She was also preparing dinner in the kitchen. Today, she had on a tight top, a skirt, and platform heels. I asked if she knew where my husband was. She replied he was upstairs taking a shower. She then immediately went over to the living room to pick up her phone and send a text message to someone. Also in the living room were a fresh bouquet of flowers. I asked her about the flowers and she said a guy she's been seeing gave them to her today. She said she didn't want to leave them in the car so she brought them inside. I asked her about the guy that she was seeing. She said he was from school and wasn't sure if it was going anywhere. I went upstairs to see that my husband had left his phone in the bedroom. He left it right on the dresser. Sure enough, the newest text message was from Ella and it read, Your wife is home. I tried looking up the deleted messages on his phone, but they had been permanently deleted. I decided to wait in our bedroom for my husband to come out of the shower. He comes out and is surprised to see me in the bedroom. Told him my 6.30 showing got cancelled. I tried to get him to hook up with me to see how he would react. He said he didn't feel comfortable doing that while Ella was in the house. 
At this point, Ella was upstairs in my younger son's room, which shares a wall with our room. Ella leaves the house at 6 p.m. with her flowers. After dinner, my husband mentioned to me about buying Ella a new car for Christmas, and his reasoning was that her car was old and not safe for our kids to ride in. I told him that I would think about it. I'm thinking about firing her on Monday without telling my husband and seeing how they both react. I'm still trying to process everything going on. Still hoping all of this is just me overthinking. I really love my husband and I can't stand the thought of our beautiful family splitting up. The car purchase suggestion to me was the fishiest thing of all. OP. Ella's family is not a family of means, but she now has a new iPhone, new clothes, jewelry, and shoes. I didn't put both together until my husband suggested buying her a brand new car. We share a bank account for bills, but we also both have separate accounts. Also, I just remembered last week, my husband came home with a new jacket. He told me that he liked it, so he bought it. My husband never buys clothes for himself. There's no reason for her to be coming over in heels and all dressed up, just if she's going to be babysitting, if there wasn't something else going on. OP. I 100% agree with this. When she first started, she would come in baggy clothing. Now she comes in dresses or skirts. My husband likes my nails white. Ella has white nails now too. Update. Yesterday morning, I met up with Ella and I told her we wouldn't be needing her services anymore due to my little sister being available to watch the kids, which is true. She quietly said that she understood and said to let her know if I would change my mind. Husband called me five minutes later, sounding very upset about Ella being fired. I think Ella told him, but he claimed her dad told him that we fired her. I told him that was my final decision and there was no changing it. He came home 20 minutes later and asked me why I didn't talk to him first about firing her. I told him about everything I've noticed between them from the text to the clothing attire that she wears. He denied everything and said it was all in my head. I told him if you want this marriage not to end in a divorce, he had to cut all contact with Ella. After one hour of arguing, he finally agreed to not contact her anymore. I honestly don't have the mental energy to deal with a divorce, split my kids, date again. I don't want to be the single mom, always busy and unhappy. I told him to never bring her up again. I don't know 100% if they had an affair, but I think it's better for my health not to find out. I think I'm going to quit my job and raise my kids, work on my marriage. I'm not sure if this was all because I've been working a lot of hours and have been distant from my husband. Thanks again for all the support. One more thing. Guys, stop sending me pictures of yourself here on Reddit. I'm not interested. Somehow, I don't think firing her is going to fix their marriage. OP is taking ignorance is bliss to heart. Waiting for the post-holiday update where OP finds out her husband bought Ella a car already. Significant comment from OP. He cheated on me once before in college. We had been dating for three months and he promised it would never happen again. This is the first time since then that I've ever suspected anything. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or her husband? Please let us know. Once a cheater, always a cheater. Oh, come on, Karen. We're probably going to get thumbs downs from you saying that. Yeah, from cheaters. My best friend ditched me on a vacation we spent years planning after her boyfriend proposed to her on the first night of our vacation. My best friend, let's call her Anne. She has a boyfriend who we'll call Mark. Originally, we were supposed to take this trip in early 2020, but that didn't happen due to lockdown. We luckily managed to get a refund on the majority of things. This trip served two main purposes. Firstly, for a vacation we both have wanted to do since we were young. And secondly, she was going to see a big chunk of her mom's side of the family who she hasn't seen in over a decade. It was kind of split 50-50. Since this was supposed to be almost a two-month trip, I personally would have been saving for years now. One thing to note is that Anne is fluent in the primary language of where we are vacationing while I am not. I can talk to some city people enough to get by, but once I leave and the slang and dialects start popping in, I'm lost. It was just supposed to be me and Anne, however a last minute addition was made with her including her current boyfriend of 3 years with us. This was more or less dropped on me pretty much 2 weeks before we left. I was really unhappy with this because well, it messed up a lot of our plans but I begrudgingly accepted him after we reworked some stuff. However, I told Anne multiple times and her boyfriend that this trip is about us, not Anne and her boyfriend. The first night we were there, Mark dropped to one knee, pulled out the ring, and asked her to marry him. Since then, I feel like a third wheel who's no longer welcome on the trip. This has changed everything. The trip is now basically about Anne and her new fiancé. Multiple times we had a lot of plans, including things we had already paid for, 
and instead, she ended up ditching me to go spend time with Mark. Tomorrow, we're supposed to catch a train and travel for the next leg of our trip, and she wants me to go alone. Instead, she confronted me and said that she needs at least a week to figure out feelings and organize her thoughts, so instead, they booked without telling me some fancy couple thing. Instead, she wants me to go on a trip alone as a woman in a country I can barely speak the language. Even worse, I'm basically going to have to show up to some extended part of her family alone and ask to stay there. She said it's fine, but it really, I'm not comfortable with it at all. I tried to talk to her and she got really upset and told me this vacation isn't just about me and that hurt me a lot. Now pretty much I'm going to be spending Christmas alone in a country where I don't even speak the language. I got pretty emotional and asked her what am I expected to do. She got really defensive and said it's just a week and we're already here until early February. She'll meet up with me on New Year's Eve or the day after. My question is, how can I talk to her and make her understand that she can't just ditch me without coming off like a massive jerk? Your friendship is over, my friend. I would accept that you need to rework this trip for yourself to make it a solo trip. She doesn't care for you or your safety or your comfort. It sucks, but how are you supposed to take it? Spend that extra money to be safe and hopefully she doesn't owe you any money. If you owe her money, I would keep track of your extra expenses and then let her know you're taking it from money you owe her. Please update me and I hope your trip turns out wonderful. You can't make her treat you with respect. You can change your plans to prioritize how you can have a good time with the money and time you have dedicated to this trip. Bail from whatever you don't want to do by yourself. Maybe even take a flight to another country or cut your trip short. Am I the jerk for canceling my aunt's invitation to my wedding when she traveled the world to attend it? My husband and I, 26 female, got married three weeks ago. My husband is from South Africa, but I'm French, so our wedding in the Savannah in South Africa was a huge trip for the 13 French guests. We rented a beautiful lodge where you see lions, elephants, etc. And to thank everyone for coming all this way, we rented it for two days. Day one is the wedding, day two is the pool party. We only invited 30 people, the people that we love. I had a huge argument with my aunt, who's 38, eight years ago, and we cut ties ever since then. But doing the invitations, I thought about how close we used to be. I decided to invite her. There was no plus one for anyone, so I only invited my aunt, not her partner or her kid since I barely even know their names. My aunt said she was happy but insisted that we invite them. I told her no, but my mom teamed up with her and pressured me a lot during the year. I explained that the ceremony meant everything to us and we only want people we love to be present. But my aunt booked flights for her but also for her family. She said it was a family trip, but added that she heard some of my guests canceled, so there is now space for her family. I told her that it would not be happening, but that her family could join us for the pool party the next day. After that, I got even more pressured by my mom to also invite them to the wedding itself, because they're coming all this way. But I kept refusing and tried to finish my dress without my mom. On the big day after the ceremony, my husband and I left for an hour in the savannah with the photographers to take a few photos. As soon as we came back to the lodge, my aunt came in smirking. She was holding her kid. Her partner was behind her. I'm not the scandal type. I didn't know how to react. In my disbelief, I said hello to her kid and shook hands with her partner. I immediately felt sad for not defending myself. I then heard my mom and grandma telling my aunt about the extra chairs and food we had and that her family must stay for dinner. My sister lied for me, saying we don't have enough chairs because some are broken, so my aunt announced that they were leaving. I asked why she's leaving with them and she was supposed to stay for the dinner and they're only five minutes away. She replied that she never intended to stay for dinner, but that she will spend time with us when they come back tomorrow for the pool party day. I was shocked. I replied that I had a change of plans and that she and her family could not come for the next day anymore. My mom, usually lovely, lost it and told me that I had no right to cancel my aunt's invitation to the pool party. I reminded her that we paid for the whole wedding ourselves and that she has no say in who I host, and I walked away. But she yelled at me in front of everyone. She was screaming that the conversation was not over and that I better come back. My sister had to physically bar my mom from running after me. I still stood my ground and kept my aunt from coming back the next day. Am I the jerk? Not the jerk. Based on your title, I thought, wow, that sounds terrible. But reading the context, your actions make sense. And that's what your aunt and mom counted on. They carefully planned to make you look like the villain 
when you just asked your aunt to do what every other guest did. Not the jerk. There was absolutely no reason that her kid and her partner could have stayed at the hotel or lodge while aunt was the one at the wedding and the dinner. Your aunt and her lovely sister, your mother, who didn't pay for anything associated with the wedding, were out of line. Kudos to your sister for having your back. Best wishes for a happy marriage. Everyone sucks here. This is petty. France to South Africa is a trek your aunt perhaps didn't want to make alone. It's wild to me when people have really difficult wedding locations and don't seem to appreciate the effort, time, and expense it takes for guests to attend. Of course your aunt was impolite here. She asked, you said no. That should have been that. It's an awkward situation. Everyone was inflexible and everyone sucks here. This is a crazy take. You can appreciate their effort without letting them walk all over you at your own darn wedding. If you set stupid rules for your wedding, don't be surprised that the guest chooses not to go. That's 100% their choice and their right. And if you get upset about it, you're a jerk. What they don't get to choose is to completely disregard your wishes and impose themselves with the excuse that they want to unnecessarily expense you never asked of them. OP is purely not the jerk for dealing with the ant here. My boyfriend, who's 30, of 16 years, won't commit to me, 29 female, even in small ways. I love my boyfriend. We've been together since high school and when I picture my future, it always includes him. I'm not sure he feels the same way. My boyfriend, Rick, fake name, and I live together. In fact, we own a home together. Even though we own a home together and have been together for 16 years, I still feel like just a roommate to him, like he can't really commit to me. Here are some things he does that kind of make me question whether he's really in this or not with me. Though we live together and own a home together, we keep our bank account separate. He also insists on paying the mortgage by himself with his own account every month. I pay some utilities and buy groceries, almost as though I'm paying rent to live in his home. Rick has not allowed me to put any personal touches on our home. Though we've lived in it for a while, it looks the same as when we moved in, with the exception of the room his computer is in, which is now decorated to his liking. Every time I mention something we could do, like paint, or show him something I like, he either tells me it's dumb or says he doesn't like it. I don't push him because I don't want to start an argument. Rick and I recently got engaged. Now, I know that doesn't scream commitment issues, but hear me out. A few years ago, a couple of close friends of ours got engaged. I was upset because I've had to watch all of my friends get married after being with their boyfriends for much shorter periods of time. He caught on to the bad mood I was in during their engagement and wedding, and I told him why I was upset. So a week after their wedding, he agreed to get me a ring. I went with him to buy it. I thought I was finally getting somewhere, but he told me it wasn't an engagement and that I could wear it, but he had asked me when he was ready. It's like he bought the ring to shut me up about marriage. After months of his friends cracking jokes about our non-engagement, he finally just decided one night while we were at home that it could be official. He said he had a huge plan to surprise me to propose, but I never heard anything else about it. It wasn't my dream proposal, but it was finally happening, so I said yes. He insisted on a long engagement, at least a year, and didn't want to set a date at first. I began planning and looking at wedding stuff because I figured it would eventually happen, but he never seemed interested. It's been about six months and we've picked a date with much pushing on my part, but he wants nothing to do with any wedding planning unless it's to voice his dislike of something I've done. He spends most of his days on his computer when he's not at work and if he does happen to come out to see me, he goes right back shortly after if I so much as bring up the wedding. He has very strong opinions about what our wedding shouldn't be, but doesn't want to talk about the wedding at all to give me an idea of what he does want. Every idea I have for the wedding gets shot down, it's almost as though he's trying to stop the wedding from ever happening by making sure I can't plan it. He told my close friend's husband, their friends, that he regrets proposing because I've been going crazy about the wedding and that he wouldn't have proposed had he known what it was going to be like. Like what? He's surprised that wedding planning takes place after you get engaged? I don't think I'm going overboard about any of it, but it's a huge deal to me. I've spent over half of my life with this man and I've always dreamed of a huge wedding. I just don't know what to do. It's like he agrees to commit to me in certain ways, but when it comes to actually doing anything concrete, he can't do it. It's hard to talk to friends about it because the ones who do know the whole situation think he proposed just to get everyone, including me, off of his back about it. What do you guys think? What hurt me the most was when he told our mutual friends that he essentially doesn't want to marry me. I'm afraid that he proposed because our family and friends were always asking when it was going to happen. It got to the point that when we would visit his family, they'd ask us, so did it happen yet? 
and we'd know what they meant, an engagement. I worry that he's with me because we have a semi-open relationship and he doesn't think he can find another woman who would agree to that. I don't think I'm explaining it right, but essentially we can hook up with other people as long as we're both there. The open relationship was his idea and now I think it may have been his way of getting the best of both worlds without having to commit to either. Update. I hired a lawyer and moved out one day while Rick was at work. Because my name is on the title and the mortgage, my lawyer assures me he either has to sell the house and split the profit with me or buy me out. I know he can't afford to buy me out, so I assume we'll put it up for sale. I get most of my things out of the house, except for a vanity and a dresser that are too heavy for my friends and I to move. I moved out the day before Halloween. Since then, I've messaged Rick a few times to see what we're going to do about the house and to schedule a time to come pick up the rest of my furniture. He's pretty evasive about all of it, so last Thursday I showed up at the house with some of my friends to help me get the stuff. He changed the locks so I can't get in. We wait for him to get off work and come back, and he lets me go in to get all my stuff. All he said before he let me in was, You asked for this, so I don't want to hear it. I didn't know what he meant. I was absolutely not prepared to walk through that door, but when I did, it became obvious why he didn't want me to come pick up my stuff. I didn't even recognize the house that I lived in just a week prior. It was painted, there was furniture and art and things everywhere, and I could tell by looking around that Rick didn't do this by himself. There are pictures of him and some woman all over the place. They have to go back at least a year because one of them was taken on New Year's, though I couldn't tell what year. I just left. I can buy more furniture, but I couldn't spend a second more in that house. Rick texted me right after I left saying, We're not selling. We're just going to buy you out. I was at a complete loss for words. I'm still in shock. I spent 16 years with this guy and he was with someone else for who knows how long. I'm trying to get over it the best I can, but it's hard. It would be hard leaving just because we've been together so long. But to find out that your life was pretty much a lie was a hard pill to swallow. What hurts me even more is that for years, I tried to decorate my house to make it a home and he wouldn't let me. She couldn't have lived with him for more than a week and the house already looks different. I honestly don't know how I was so blind, but I'm glad I got out when I did, even if he did waste half of my life. Update. A lot of you have pointed out that my name would still be on the mortgage even if I sell. So I've decided not to sign the paperwork accepting the buyout. Rick was not okay with this and has been blowing up my phone ever since he found out, calling me names and saying that I was just trying to ruin his life because he was finally happy. I know we're both upset because they put a lot of effort into the home in the short time since I've left and honestly, I kind of feel better that they won't be able to enjoy it. I know it sounds terrible, but making this harder on them is making me feel better about the entire situation. For the majority of our relationship, I felt he was always the one in control of everything. It's nice to have the final say. I know I've said a lot that he wasted half of my life, but I'd like to clarify that I don't think I'm too old or that it's too late for me, just that I couldn't understand why this man would string someone along for as long as he did. He's pretty much all I've known, and it took a lot for me to leave him. I feel like I've missed out on a lot of the dating experience, but I think I'll be okay. I'm just going to enjoy being alone for right now. Since I moved out, I've been staying with a friend. I signed a lease for a one-bedroom apartment today, so by this time next week I'll have my own place. I've already bought a bunch of things to decorate it with and I didn't have to get anyone's permission to do so. Did the other woman know about me? I'm not sure if she did. She knows I'm the ex now and I own half of the house, though I'm not sure she's aware of how recently we were together and I was living there. Last New Year's Eve, I was out of state because my mother was in the hospital. Before that, I had a job managing in retail and I typically always had to work either late into New Year's Eve or early New Year's Day. The picture could have been taken between 2011 until this last new year. I'll definitely be going back to get my furniture. I was just so shocked at the time that I couldn't be there. When I get really angry, I cry, and I didn't want to give him the satisfaction of seeing that. When told that as long as her name is on the mortgage, she can't be barred from the home. OP. I don't know why I didn't think of this. It didn't even cross my mind to mention to my lawyer that he's been preventing me access to a home that I own. I'm definitely going to speak to my lawyer about making sure I get a new key and making sure she can no longer live there. I don't care how vindictive that sounds. I've earned the right to be a little vindictive. How does one even have the energy to keep going like this? Fighting so hard to make sure she doesn't know and fighting so that she can't personalize anything. To keep a relationship that doesn't make you happy while knowing you're just kicking the can down the road. Meanwhile, keeping a full relationship on the side. 
he was always waiting for her to break up with him. What I don't understand is why he didn't just do it himself. OP might be too naive for her own good, but holy cow, Rick is spineless slime. Honestly, I don't know why she's surprised. She accepted the crumbles of a relationship for him and a semi-open relationship. Why would she think he was going to give her anything else if he always was very clear about the little regard he had for her? He's a jerk, sure, but she's delusional to think that this was going to have any other outcome. My friend's mom refuses to pay me, so I'm suing her. My friend's mom asked me to be her social media manager. She cannot afford my regular rate, but we agreed on an amount that's about a quarter of what I typically charge. I got all the credentials and I went right to it. I increased her following, online visibility, and her overall social media presence. The first month I had a reminder to pay my invoice, and she eventually did. The second month she cited issues with her online banking and asked my friend to pay. That never happened. We eventually agreed that I'll be paid the end of the third month. The agreed time rolled around and I got nothing but excuses. I was promised cash, but I never got it. These are usually very nice people, so I didn't think much about it. I got caught up in work and school and moving apartments. The next thing I knew, it had been over six months and I hadn't been paid for any of the services I'd been rendering. I reached out to her and she promised to pay up and said that she was having some financial difficulties. The agreed date rolled around yet again and she didn't pay me nor did she even reach out. I called her and I got no answer. I sent a message. She replied two weeks later saying that something had come up. She promised to pay again and the date came and no word. She doesn't answer my calls and she leaves me on red. We had paused working on her stuff back in June of this year but I'm still supposed to get paid. I've asked my friend twice to ask her to pay me. Now my question is, would I be the jerk for suing my friend's mom? Edit to answer some questions. 1. Sadly, there is no contract. I was naive and trusting. She's usually very nice and seemingly honest and I thought she had integrity. 2. I'm owed for 7 months work. I accept my part in this, but I was busy and in the back of my mind I'll have a lump sum to pay towards an upcoming expense that I had. Everything was good until I tried to settle the invoices. 3. We did agree on a payment plan. I haven't even been trying to collect the full amount. All this back and forth has been for two out of seven installments owed. 4. She's not broke. She lives in a nice suburb, drives a nice car. Her bills are paid. She spoils her kids and her grandkids. Also, any advice on how to be less naive so I don't get taken advantage of anymore? I have a hard time saying no. Edit 2. By Sue, I meant small claims court. It's not enough to warrant hiring a lawyer, but it's my money and I want it. It could pay for a vacation weekend, a semester in school, rent and utilities for a month, plus a trip to Costco. Not the jerk, but be prepared to lose the friend. Not the jerk. Best option is to explain to the friend what has happened and specifically show them the amount of hours that you worked on it. Explain that you need pain for these hours, as like all of us, you have bills to pay, and that if you don't, then you may need to take drastic action. That way, the friend may be able to do something and at least will understand. Not the jerk, but seek legal advice before suing. A strongly worded legal letter may be enough to show her that you're serious. Well, what would you do in this situation? Would you sue your friend's mom or not? Please let us know. If I complete our agreed upon work and you refuse to pay me, darn right you're getting sued. My manager told me to take a break, so I did. I currently work at a Mexican chain here in Australia. A few months back, we had this really bad manager who was doing a placement at our store while her store was undergoing repairs from flooding. She's the type of person who looks down on you because you're a worker and she's a manager. When I first started, I did an opening shift with her. I hadn't done one before and I kept asking questions, which she kept getting annoyed at and kept acting like I should know what I was doing and kept leaving her alone. She belittled me for not getting the meats out on time, aka two minutes past opening. She yelled at me because I didn't put coriander in our salsa when we were out of coriander. She yelled at me for putting too many beans on one burrito, despite me following the build guide. She had been yelling at me and treating me very badly all day to the point that I had almost walked out and left her, but I kept my cool. It's well known in the store that I have hip dysplasia, which in turn really hurts my lower back, so I have to sit down for a few minutes and rest it. Afterwards, I'm usually fine. It's on my file and the store manager has always been fine with it as long as it's not during a rush. 
That day was an especially bad day. So after around 5 hours on my feet, my back was really starting to ache. So I asked her if I could sit down for a few minutes to rest as the busy period had passed. Manager. Why? Can't you just work? Me. I have hip dysplasia, so I need to sit for at least 5 minutes. The store manager has always been fine with it. Manager. That doesn't even make any sense. No, you can't sit down. Me. I'm in a lot of pain. All I need is five minutes. I'll come back out if it gets busy. No, I don't pay you to sit down. Go take your break instead. 30 minutes and don't come back until you're done complaining. So I made myself some lunch and sat down in our dining room. About five minutes later, the busiest rush of a lifetime came through the door. We were still a reasonably new store and hype was high. So I'm talking a line going out of the door and it kept growing. My manager's face turned white as she started serving people who are ordering large amounts of food per person. She gave me these looks of distress, asking for my help with her eyes. Cue my malicious compliance. I sat on my phone, looking as relaxed as humanly possible, taking very big and dramatic mouthfuls of my food while watching YouTube very loudly. I had customers ask me if I could hop behind the counter, but I simply said, I'm sorry. My manager sent me on break and said not to come back until I'm done complaining about my back problems and I'm still very sore. She stared daggers at me, but I just kept eating my lunch. Customers started getting angry at her for not moving fast enough to keep up with the demand, but she knows she can't blame me because of what she said earlier, so she just keeps apologizing. She was running around the back to get salads from the fridge, swapping meats around, getting new sauces, basically things that a second employee is meant to be there to help with all while customers kept complaining. I just sat and watched, smirking as she clearly regretted not just letting me sit down for five minutes, otherwise I would have been there to help. When the rush finally ended about 40 minutes later, I clocked back on and said, thanks for the extended break, my back feels so much better now, which incited many glares in my direction. I didn't have to serve even one of the probably 40 to 50 customers that came through the door. She treated me better after that, and is now always her kindest self when she's around me, so I call that a win. Luckily, her store was repaired and she went back there. People said I was a jerk for this, but I don't care. Next week will be my final shift at that store, and I'm very thankful I'll never have to be under her management again. Am I the jerk for telling my parents they still don't have a biological grandkid? I have three adopted kids, and my parents have so far been good grandparents to them. They've never mentioned to me or my husband or to the kids anything about having a problem that I adopted instead of having biological kids. My brother and his wife have a three-month-old son who was conceived with a donor. I know this because my brother's wife talked to me about it, but my parents were not aware. They treated my nephew the same as they treated my kids when they were babies, so I've never been concerned that my kids would be seen as lesser because they're adopted while my nephew was supposedly their biological grandkid. This is why I was so surprised and confused that my parents have been talking about how excited they are to have their first Christmas with their biological grandkid and that they did a big expensive holiday photo shoot with my brother, his wife, and his son, something they've never done with my kids. They were the ones who suggested it to my brother. It's not like it's just because he asked and I didn't. The weirdest part was that they casually mentioned some of the things they bought for my nephew for Christmas as far as I can tell, they're spending more on him than they are for my three kids combined, and it's far more than what they spent even when my oldest was a baby. In fact, when my kids were little, they used to say there was no point in buying expensive things for babies for Christmas or birthdays because they wouldn't remember it, and they'd rather spend the money when they're a little older. So my nephew is suddenly being favored over my kids. At the same time, my parents are starting to emphasize the fact that, as far as they know, my nephew was their biological grandkid. I pointed this out to them and said it bothers me. They denied treating them differently. They said I was being weird about money. I truly don't even care about the money. I care about the difference in treatment and that my kids might notice how little they're getting from my parents compared to their cousin. And now for the part I'm starting to feel awful about. I told them the truth about my nephew. My parents are furious at my brother for not telling them and thank me for telling them the truth. They keep saying he tricked them and gave them false hope about having a biological grandkid, which I guess answers the question on whether biology actually matters to them. My husband says I did the right thing because it removed all the lies and secrets, and if they didn't care, it wouldn't matter. But if they did care, they deserve to know. 
My brother says it wasn't my secret to tell, and I jeopardized his son's relationship with our parents. Soft, everyone sucks here. It wasn't your secret to tell. You were wrong to do it that way. But grandparents are super jerks, and so is your brother. Here's what would have been better. Go to bro, tell him what you've seen and how it makes you feel. Tell him that he needs to tell his parents, and if he doesn't, you will. But you didn't. So, acknowledge that you handled your part badly, but that doesn't excuse everyone else's way worse behavior. OP's brother and sister-in-law don't have to say a darn thing if they don't want to. While I agree with the everyone sucks here judgment, OP isn't a saint either. I mean, let's be real here. She only spilled the beans out of spite. She spoke about a very sensitive topic instead of tearing her parents a new one and going low contact or no contact to show that she means business. If the situation was that bad, that would have been a reasonable option. Not the jerk. I'm prepared to be downvoted, but I'm willing to bet brother knew exactly how your parents felt about your kids and withheld the truth from them because he knew how they'd react. Sure, it was their info to tell, but they had no intention of saying anything of the like because they were enjoying the benefits that came with keeping their mouths shut. Your brother did not care that you or your kids were being treated differently or unfairly because he wasn't on the receiving end. Now that he is, he cares about privacy. Your actions might have been sus, but that doesn't make you the jerk here. Your brother, however, is. He was willing to do his own son a disservice by setting him up with a false relationship with his grandparents while teaching him that your kids were okay to be treated as less than. Nah, he got his just desserts. He just didn't count on eating them this soon. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or their brother or their parents? Please let us know. If you're using a donor and you don't want people to know, don't tell anyone because you know they're not going to end up keeping it a secret for you. Karen demands a silver laptop. This story dates back to about nine years ago when I, male, 31 at the time that the story took place, worked as a lead IT technician for a large multinational company. The company had a range of different laptops available for employees to choose from that were classified by their size and weight. This is important for later including standard laptops, which had a 14-inch screen, as well as lightweight laptops, smaller and thinner with a 12.5-inch screen, handy if you're a frequent traveler. Most of these laptops were pretty boring, gray, business devices, nothing special to look at. Anyway, one day the computer manufacturer introduced a new lightweight laptop model that was silver in color and a far more sleek and good-looking than the previous gray model. We had deployed a few of these around the building and soon got a visit from a lady who'd seen one of her colleagues with a shiny new silver laptop and had developed a severe case of shiny device envy. We'll call her Karen for the purpose of this story. Karen, how do I go about getting one of those smaller laptops? Me, your current standard laptop isn't due to be replaced yet, but you can request a change to a lightweight laptop on the IT website. Your manager will need to approve it, however. Now, to be honest, I wasn't a particular fan of people who waste the company's money simply by wanting the latest shiny gadgets, especially because it creates additional work for my team and involves replacing equipment that's still perfectly functional and within warranty. But I behaved in a professional manner and I simply towed the company line. Karen walked away and the next day an approved request came through for a lightweight laptop. Fair enough. What she didn't know was that company policy dictated that we only provided a brand new laptop if we didn't have usable second-hand laptops in stock. For example, the ones that IT handed back in when they left the company. Being the good IT tech that I am, I scoured our return shelf and sure enough, there was a used lightweight laptop in stock. Unfortunately for this lady, it was last year's gray model. But rules are rules, so I asked one of my team to prep it for her. She's then told that it's ready and comes along to pick it up. She takes one look at it and promptly throws a tantrum. This isn't the one I wanted. I wanted the silver one. Me. Sorry, company policy is that we can only order a new laptop if we don't have usable second-hand ones in stock. Karen. But this is not the one that I ordered. Me. Yes, it is. You ordered a lightweight laptop and this is exactly what we've set up for you. I turn the laptop over and I show her the company's sticker, confirming that it's the same classification of lightweight laptop as her request. And I show her that it's physically smaller and lighter than her existing laptop. No, I wanted a new silver one. This is unacceptable. 
I'm going to complain to your boss. She stormed off in a huff and I could soon hear her complaining inside my boss's office. Unfortunately, although my boss knew I was just following the process, he couldn't handle all of the repeated moaning and soon folded and asked me to order a new device for her. I wasn't pleased at being overruled when I was simply applying company policy, particularly when it's just a waste of money for an employee that wants the latest silver gadget, so cue malicious compliance. I could have just scoured our shelf of brand new laptops and dug out a new one for her. We installed dozens of laptops a week. It was a big company, so we always had plenty of new ones in stock. But I was told to order a new one. That's the process that I'd follow. Me. Okay, we can order a brand new silver one for you. But you'll need to raise another request ticket so we can order the laptop from it. I said this knowing full well that this ticket would go to Karen's manager once again for approval. A manager who has a finite department budget. Sure enough, an hour later, I get a phone call from their manager. Manager. Why is Karen ordering yet another laptop? Me. She didn't like the color of the laptop we'd prepared for her. It was gray and she wanted a silver one. Manager. How much is this going to cost me? Me. Well, you'll still be paying the monthly lease cost on their original laptop as it wasn't due for replacement, plus the lease costs on the lightweight laptop we prepared for her earlier. And there'll also be the lease cost for this new laptop as well. Manager. Oh, no way. I'm not paying for all that. I'll reject this ticket and I'll have a word with her. A short while later, Karen returns. She's rather quiet and humble now after being chastised by her boss for trying to waste all of his budget in the pursuit of having the latest shiny silver gadget. She quietly accepts the gray lightweight laptop we prepared earlier for her and then quickly departs. I spend the rest of the day with a grin on my face. Am I the jerk for yelling at my boyfriend for eating my donut? This is so dumb but this is somehow one of the biggest fights we've had. I bought a crappy donut earlier today after me and my boyfriend finished some Christmas shopping and had dinner. I bought one and we were going to share it. We regularly share food. We go to my parents' house to pick up our dog and chill out a bit before going home. I'm in the bathroom and my boyfriend starts eating my donut and telling me how bad it is. Stale and there's no cream in it. It's a Boston cream. I tell him that there's no way he's eating my donut right now and to stop, or at least save me some of it. He eats the whole donut. I get out of the bathroom and I'm kind of upset. I wanted some of that donut tonight. He's being silly and put himself in the corner in the kitchen, pretending he's there out of shame. I'm upset and ask him if he really ate it, and he makes a joke and says it was so bad and not worth the calories. I just wanted a donut, so I tell him that and he should have saved me some. He says that he apologized here, but I don't even remember this. We go back into the living room and my dad is telling me to drop it and that I'm overreacting for no reason. My mom is telling my boyfriend to apologize just because it obviously bothered me and that's reason enough to apologize. My mom was kind of condescending towards him and the vibe got tense. I don't want to start some dumb fight over nothing so we say our goodbyes and leave. On the way home I ask him to apologize and he says I'm making a big deal out of nothing and hugely overreacting. I say he's gaslighting me. We're both upset. We get home and keep talking about it in circles. I just want an apology to end this and he starts yelling that I'm acting like a five-year-old and that I made a scene in front of my parents and that I'm overreacting so badly he doesn't even recognize me. I'm mad because he's gaslighting me into thinking I'm wrong and yelling at me for no reason and it doesn't matter if the donut was bad or not, at least half of it was mine. Anyways, he yells, my feelings are hurt, and we go to separate rooms and chill out for a bit. Later, we talk about it a bit, and we both apologize, but maintain that we are in the right. So Reddit, who's in the right in this extremely dumb fight? We have both reviewed this post, and we agree with its facts. Him, he claims he wouldn't have been mad if I ate the last Oreo as an example, and that I dragged it out for too long, meaning my anger because it was just a donut. He says that he felt singled out by my mom, and that's worse than the donut. Edit. My boyfriend insisted I add that we've been together for eight years and that if this happened a month into our relationship, he agrees it would be psychotic. But what's a donut or two after eight years? Not the jerk. He ate your half of the donut. He knew you were meant to share it. He then made excuses for eating the whole thing and then tried to blame you for overreacting. 
and tried the old, I wouldn't be mad if you did the same. You know he would be. He owes you a donut or a donut equivalent. Not the jerk. The plan was to share it, right? He selfishly inhaled the whole thing. He should apologize and make up for it next time. Your parents probably shouldn't have gotten involved. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or her boyfriend? Please let us know. This isn't even about the donut. It's about his lack of consideration for how you feel. Has he always acted like this or is it something new? Am I the jerk for not helping a woman who had a baby with my ex-husband get survivor's benefits? I'm 43. My ex-husband, Duke, 54, and I divorced because he habitually cheated on me. We were divorced a little over two years when he passed in a motorcycle accident. I paid for his funeral because of my daughter who's 15 and despite everything, he was her father and I didn't want the state to bury him. That was four months ago and my daughter is doing well. I applied for survivor's benefits for her shortly after his funeral and have been receiving monthly payments. Yesterday, I received a phone call from my caseworker at the social security office informing me that a woman called claiming that she had a three-year-old son by my ex. However, the woman had no proof the boy is actually my ex-husband's, no signed birth certificate or DNA test. The caseworker asked me if I would be willing to allow my daughter to do a DNA test to prove the kid's paternity. I refused. I did the math and this baby was definitely conceived while I was still married to my ex. Furthermore, at the time of the conception, I had gone through a very difficult hysterectomy with major setbacks. I suspect I know who this woman is and she definitely knew my ex-husband and I were still married. I'm mad and I'm not even sure that I'm doing the right thing by refusing. But I was humiliated enough by my ex when he was alive and I feel even more embarrassed now. Update. About a month after I found out about this kid, I did indeed tell my daughter, who is now 17 by the way. She was shocked, as you can imagine, and very hurt by her dad's actions. I explained to her the full situation and she didn't want to do it then. She said she needed time, so that's what I gave her. Incidentally, she has been in therapy since before, during, and after the divorce. Her father and her were never really close at all. The woman who had an affair with my husband was a work colleague slash friend. We all worked together at the same place. We both still work there, just in different areas. After I got the call from my caseworker, several mutual acquaintances approached me and told me that she wanted to sit down and talk with me about her problem. I thought about that for a few days and ultimately decided to meet up with her. We met at a coffee shop by our job on Saturday. She told me that she and my ex started out as friends at first. He would give her advice on how to deal with her other two kids' dad. She said she very quickly turned it into flirting and hanging out and eventually a full-on affair. By this time, he's telling her I was getting suspicious that something was going on and she was already pregnant. She told him about the pregnancy and he told her he wouldn't be leaving me but he would assist her with whatever the kid needed. She was hurt and angry, but stuck with the situation as she was already struggling with the two kids she had and needed the help. She went on to say that he was very much in love with me and that she was jealous of me for having him. Not one time was this woman remorseful. No apologies, nothing. I asked her, did she even care what their affair did to my daughter? And she replied no, because she had enough on her plate dealing with her own kids and quite frankly, didn't care about mine. That's word for word, by the way. At this point, I told her that I've informed my daughter about her son and she's currently not interested in participating in this scenario. She got outraged by that, telling me I have to make my daughter do this, that she is only part-time at our job and her kids can't survive on her income alone. I told her that she was a jerk, that if she even felt a little bit of guilt, I might have been able to talk my daughter around but her lack of respect for my daughter's feelings is why I won't. I left her there yelling at me as I walked away to my car. She has since quit working at our job. Over the past year, I've addressed the situation with my daughter and she still doesn't want to do it. I've told her it's her decision either way and I support what she wants. My ex's parents are both deceased and his one sister is passed. He has an older brother, but they haven't communicated in decades. I tried to find out about him when my ex passed, but I couldn't find anything. My ex was passed two full days before the police finally got in contact with me. It was a shock. I never hated him. I hated what he did. There is a difference. Update 2 First off, let me say, I did not hate my husband. 
I don't even hate his affair partner. And the moment when this all happened, I was in shock and total disbelief. I reacted without any real thought. I challenge anyone on here to say they haven't responded angrily with unwanted and unexpected news. However, I'm not a person who doesn't think of consequences to my actions, and that's why I sat down, calmed down, and figured out how to proceed. I talked to both my mom and my brothers before I talked to my daughter. They were also shocked, but urged me to talk to my daughter and get her input on the situation. Some of you think that I'm using this situation to get back at my ex. I'm not. My ex and I talked at least twice a week. We had disagreements, sure, like other people. I wish he would have told me the truth, honestly. The affair had long been out in the bag. I'm not going to say I would have enjoyed hearing it, but at least we would have known. See, we're too busy living and oftentimes we subconsciously think everything will work out for the best. It never goes that way though, does it? If he would have told us, we could have got over any shock, hurt, or resentment, and possibly the kids could have met each other a long time ago. I would have known about the boy, and we all would have been felt better prepared for when he passed. Who knows? But I'm no longer angry or hurt. Trust me when I say that I want an amicable solution to this as much as you do. That day in the coffee shop with her, I once again reacted, but I'm human and I have feelings. My ex-husband had no one else but us. As I said, he has a brother who I spent weeks trying to locate, but I couldn't. I would never have let him be buried by the state because at the end of the day, we still loved him. I was married to him for 17 years for goodness sake. The affair partner made her choices and it didn't work out for her. She hasn't lost any sleep worrying about who else she hurt along the way, but expects the very people she hurt the most to care about her hardships. The narcissism is astonishing. The teenage daughter deserves all of the time she needs. The responsibility for the toddler is on his mother, not his half-sister. She got angry because the affair partner said she doesn't care about OP's daughter. But realistically, OP similarly doesn't care about affair partner's son. She may not hate the kid, but she also doesn't have much concern for him. Also, I don't know how survivorship works. Is there a fixed benefit that would get split if the affair partner were approved? Or would OP keep the same amount of benefits and more money would be available for the affair partner? It would get split between the daughter and the son, as both would be next of kin. I hope the affair partner finds a good job and stops running after men to help take care of her kids. Getting pregnant may have even been intentional as the only strategy she knows for keeping a man who willingly helps her provide for her and other kids. The sheer callousness of the affair partner to say that she never cared about what issues she was causing to the guy's family is telling. Her poor kids are the ones to suffer for their mom's actions. Hope she gets a good job so she can stop bringing kids into the world that she can't take care of. Why do these horrible guys who cheat on their partners get all the women, while chill guys like me who would actually be loyal always get turned down? Call me a nice guy all you want, but you know it's true. So many of these stories on here are about guys who treat their girlfriend or wife really bad. These are the same girls that turned down good guys like me, and now karma is catching up to them. Brad and the Table This story was told to me by my friend Lucy. At the time, she lived in an army town and worked for many summers at a restaurant popular with the officers and their families. At this particular restaurant, which was on the higher end, there's a table reserved for high-ranking officers who visit the base. People who work there refer to it as the table. On busier nights, when there isn't a higher-ranking officer in town, it's utilized to seat more patrons, but for the most part, it's left alone. It's Friday, so it's busy. There's a general visiting the base, so the table isn't being used just in case he decides to grace the establishment with his presence. Lucy is manning her section when the owner, John, for the purpose of this story, waves her down. She heads over and he tells her, I need you and Annie, another server, to help me man the table. The general is coming? She asked. Nope, Brad is. Lucy rolled her eyes. Brad was a local big wigs high school age son and he had it in his mind that he was a hotshot. He frequented the restaurant with his girl of the week and proceeded to make a nuisance of himself every time, but not enough to the point that he was asked to leave. Lucy asked John, Are you sure? What if the general wants to eat dinner with us? At this, John leaned in with a wide smile and said, Apparently, the general called and he told us to give Brad the table and to give him and his guests anything he wanted. 
Lucy then smiled as she realized what was about to happen. Brad was about to get a serving of malicious compliance on the house. 20 minutes later, Brad, wearing a West Point blazer, arrives with several young people. John makes a big show of greeting them and escorting them to the table. The people look around, impressed, and Brad proceeds to command Lucy, John, and Annie around like he owns the restaurant. The only good thing about this particular experience was that, due to his age, Brad and his buddies never tried to order any alcohol. Brad proceeded to be a nuisance, demanding more appetizers, sending food back because it wasn't cooked right, ordering the most expensive entrees on the menu, yada yada yada. Lucy, Annie, and John continue with this, smiling as more and more food is added to the table. It's time for the check. Lucy told me that the entire group managed to rack up $843, not counting the mandatory gratuity because the party is above a certain size. Brad gets the bill and he flips out. What is this? He barked, waving the check. It's your check, John said. The general said to let you order anything you wanted. Brad stands up to argue, and that's when the host rushes up, her face white. John, the general is here, she whispered. Everyone turns to look, and there's the general with his entourage. John excuses himself before going over. He and the general start to talk for a few minutes, and Lucy notices Brad turning white and starting to get out of his seat. Annie looked at him and said, You better not try to dine and dash. I really don't want to have to sick these nice officers on you. Brad sat down and fidgeted. John and the general came back to the table. Making eye contact with Brad, John said, Brad, you said the good general here insisted you have the table and that you can order anything you want. Is this true? He only nodded. Well, the general here said that he never made no such phone call. Uh, that's odd. Brad said before looking at the general. I'm pretty sure it was you I talked to, uh, sir. I have the phone number. Let's call it, John said, pulling out his cell phone and dialing the number. That's when they heard Brad's new cell phone ringing in his pocket. The general held his hand out and Brad puts the phone in his hand. He checks the number and asks John, Is this your phone number? It is, John said. The general then proceeded to get a serious look on his face. Brad, are you a cadet? I'm being considered for an appointment, Brad said. The general nodded. I suggest you pay your bill, tip in full, and apologize to the staff for your behavior, he said to Brad. I also suggest withdrawing your name as soon as possible to save yourself the embarrassment. Keeping his head down, Brad paid the bill, meekly apologized, and left with his friends. The general and his entourage patiently waited for the table to be cleared and set. They proceeded to have a nice meal, leaving a generous tip and apologizing for people like Brad. Lucy proceeded to have a wonderful Brad-free career. My cousin is pregnant and none of us are happy about it. I'm 31 female and my younger cousin, who's 28, recently found out that she's pregnant. She's really excited, but she found out that she's having triplets. The dad, who's 45, is a real piece of work and he won't even be in the picture and he can't offer financial support either. She doesn't make very much money and she has no savings. I myself have two kids and even with the financial and emotional support of my partner, it can be very stressful. Over the past few weeks, I've gently tried to tell her that it may not be a green pasture ahead. She doesn't even have a functional car right now. It's like her head is stuck in the sand and she's only talking about how amazing it will be, how blessed she is, how it's a miracle, how she'll just figure it out. On Christmas Eve, she surprised the rest of the family with the news after doing a big surprise scavenger hunt that led to three onesies. Her mom already knew, but she told grandparents, cousins, aunts, uncles, etc. She didn't get the reaction that she was hoping for. Some people told her she should consider her options. Some talked to her about how hard this will be, asked about how she will afford this, wanted to know what support the dad would be giving, etc. It was not very celebratory. I could tell she was upset and she left early. I went to talk to her this morning in her studio apartment. I told her I was sorry for everyone's reaction, but that I could see where the family was coming from and that they just wanted what was best for her and were concerned. I asked her what she expected the reaction to be and she told me she thought everyone would rally together to help her now and to offer a bunch of help once the babies arrived. She expected financial support too. I told her that she can't rely on others like that 
and she will likely have to figure a lot of this out on her own if she goes through with it. She told me that I'm horrible, that our family is terrible, and that we all deserve each other, and that unless she gets our support, she'll cut us all out. Then she told me to leave. In some ways, I think it's a reality check, but the more I think about it, I also know how overwhelming it is to be pregnant, and I'm sorry that she didn't get any happy reactions or offers of support, especially because in the past, other family members have gotten very happy family reactions when sharing their pregnancies. Am I the jerk for agreeing with the rest of our family? You're the jerk, and most of your family is too. She's obviously happy about the pregnancy and wants those kids. Suggesting, considering her options, when she shares the news is vile. All of you could have shared your concerns in a much more supportive and sensible way. You're the jerk. You and your delusional family have no right whatsoever to determine whether or not your cousin gets to have her babies. That is her choice and hers alone. I can't imagine how heartbreaking it must have been for her to have you monsters show her absolutely zero affection whatsoever when she shares the greatest joy one can imagine with you. Regardless of what you think, she has been blessed and the Lord has a plan for these babies. She doesn't need you or anyone else's approval in order to have them. Not the jerk. I'm not surprised that these comments are tearing into you. You're speaking a language that Reddit doesn't understand. It's called common sense. She doesn't have an income, a car, or a partner who will even be in the picture, but expects to have triplets and be able to raise them? Another fine example of how truly unintelligent the people on Reddit are to claim that she's in the right and you and your family are in the wrong. We live in a world where speaking common sense will paint you as the bad guy, and people wonder why everything is only getting worse and will continue to do so. If anyone knows a country where the people have common sense, please let me know so I can move there. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP and their family or their cousin? Please let us know. If she cuts all of you out of her life, sounds like it'll be a win for you to be honest. Sounds like she plans to be a leech the rest of her life. My parents call me out at Christmas dinner for living with my fiance before marriage. Okay, two can play this game. I'm a nurse practitioner and I'm the primary care provider for a lot of the low risk maternity cases at the practice where I work. I also work hand in hand with the doctors and midwives to create a healthy maternity, birth and postpartum situation. My fiancé is completing her residency. We live together and have for a few years now. We aren't in any hurry to get married. We originally had plans to do so a couple of years ago, but then we got really busy for two years. It's driving my very religious parents crazy that their youngest son is living in sin. I don't really care. I'm an adult and I do what I want. We're getting married in June. So we're visiting my parents for Christmas. The way it came together this year, everyone is at my parents' house. So that's my folks, my three siblings, myself and fiance, and seven grandkids, so 17 people. At dinner, my mom starts going on about how she's so glad that we're finally getting married and she won't be embarrassed at church anymore. And my dad says how proud he is of his three older kids who all either waited to get married before moving in together or got married right away after moving in together. My fiance was getting embarrassed and I was getting mad over this stupid argument we have had too many times and a family dinner was the last straw. I've asked them repeatedly to just accept that they cannot control how I live my life. I refuse to stay with them when I visit, even if I come alone. Hotels are just easier. So I started talking about a premature baby I had been reading about. It was almost three months premature and weighed about 1.6 pounds. It was super strong and healthy for being born so little, and the NICU had high hopes for the baby doing well. My mom and dad both got deer in the headlights looks on their faces. Too bad. Shouldn't have messed around with my fiance's feelings. So I asked my oldest brother. He was born almost four months premature. Is there a chance that we could check out the family album where we keep all the records of family births and stuff? I already know my brother was over nine pounds and almost 23 inches long when he was born. My grandmother told me about it the first time my parents tried to shame me. The subject gets changed very fast. After supper, my parents told me that I should not have tried to embarrass them with private things that are not my concern. I told them that if I heard anything about my living arrangements ever again for the rest of my life, I would make sure to keep bringing up the fact that my mom was in her second trimester when they got married. My parents are mad at me for telling them how to behave in their own home, but my fiancé is happy that they seem to be off the subject for good. Am I the jerk? Not the jerk. 
That was beautifully handled. You didn't call them out and embarrass them, but you stood your ground. I did laugh out loud when you said where you got your blackmail information. Grandma had that in her pocket for a long time, I'm guessing. Congratulations on your upcoming wedding. Merry Christmas, and I hope you have a great new year. Not the jerk. I absolutely love this. My own judgy grandmother pretended to be oh so moral in the old-fashioned sense. My father accidentally revealed that she was pregnant when she got married to my grandfather. That was incorrect. She wasn't pregnant at all. My oldest uncle was about seven months old when they got married. And why they couldn't get married sooner? My grandfather had to get divorced from his first wife first. It's often the people with the most things to hide who enjoy judging others for things that are none of their business. Am I the jerk for buying my niece a $4,000 gift for Christmas? I happen to marry into a family with an insane amount of money, more than they know what to do with, quite honestly. I spent approximately $15,000 per kid for my three kids for Christmas, which I am immensely grateful to be able to spend on them. I also donated the same amount to a charity of each kid's choice as well. My mom's side has a rule that we only get each other Christmas gifts if we will be seeing each other that year on Christmas Day. For cousins with kids, we get the kids' gifts rather than their parents. My mother hosted this year, and about 10 of my cousins and their kids were coming. I bought each of my cousins' kids something unique, not really thinking about the price, but more what I thought that they would like. My cousin, 35, male, has a 14-year-old daughter. She's the result of a random hookup, so most of us in the family have only met her mother a handful of times and only for a few minutes. My daughter is also 14, and two parts of her Christmas Day gifts were a Cartier love ring and a YSL purse. I bought the same for my cousin's daughter, as they are very close in age and I thought that she'd really like it. My cousin's daughter excitedly FaceTimed her mother to show her the gifts that I had bought her, and upon ending the FaceTime, her mother called my cousin and she was livid. She said that I spent more on her daughter for Christmas than she had and was livid with me. I genuinely didn't think about the cost of the gifts, just more what I thought that she would really like, especially considering I have a 14-year-old daughter myself and I know what they like. My cousin's daughter's mother is really upset with me because she feels that I made her look bad to her own daughter, but I only ever intended on getting her daughter gifts that I thought she'd like. Am I the jerk? You're the jerk. Most 14-year-olds don't dream of YSL purses and Cartier bracelets. I think the money has gone to your head and you just don't live in the real world anymore. What's normal to you and your husband's family is not normal for the majority of the world. I spent $15,000 on each of my three kids and donated the same amount to charity. Who spends $90,000 at Christmas? Even if I had it, I wouldn't. People who can afford to? Why is that an issue here? Because Reddit hates people that they're jealous of. I'd love to have gotten a YSL purse at 14 and happy to be able to help out at my favorite cause. But then some others get so jealous they have to resort to hate to put people down. Human nature is a funny thing. Or, get this, they hate the extreme wealth disparity that exists in many countries. Which is OP's fault, how? And giving equal amounts to helping others as she gives to her kids is literally helping mitigate that wealth gap. Or would you prefer she empties her bank account and house and gives it all away? Her husband's family success is not something she needs to apologize for. Honestly, people don't get into fortunes big enough that they can spend effortlessly $90,000 for Christmas gifts by being fair. They do that by exploiting workers, clients, environment, and or the law system. Because being a decent person is not profitable. And sure, OP probably has nothing to do with the cause of the fortune, but she profits off that exploit, and people do have the right to be salty about it. And spending a bit of it on charity which usually gets included in taxes anyway, does not make it even by no means. Not the jerk. I think you did a nice thing that was just a little extravagant and you unintentionally overshadowed her mother. I think her mother overreacted. It's not like you bought her a car or a puppy or something she needs to be responsible for. To be honest, I think a lot of the you're the jerk comments you're getting are from people who are quite jealous and annoyed that you have so much money to spend. I don't think you're malicious at all. I do think the money was excessive, but not enough for me to call you a jerk. So, I'm going to vote not the jerk. Well, what do you think? Is OP the jerk or not? Please let us know. I kicked my family out on Christmas after what they said to my daughter. 
I, 48 female, and my husband, 48 male, have two kids, Randy, who's 22, and Eve, who's 19. Eve was diagnosed with autism when she was in elementary school. She does school online currently and can do some pretty basic tasks by herself, but me and my husband have to do a lot for her, cook for her, drive her places, etc. She recently started doing her own laundry, which we're very proud of, but it took like four years of learning and encouragement. We love her and we know we'll have to care for her. Eve loves toys. She especially likes dolls and little interactive animal toys. For Christmas, we had my parents, my two sisters and their husbands, my one sister's 15-year-old daughter, and my mom's sister and her husband. Randy got a few games he wanted, plus a new laptop he needs for his classes next semester. Eve got dolls, a small dollhouse, some pajamas, some stuffed animals, and the big gift was an interactive horse toy that you can braid the hair of and things. Eve was overjoyed and played with it up until it was time for lunch. I didn't notice anything before, but at lunch, my mom was looking over at my sister, Brianna, and her daughter, Marissa, like they had done something wrong. I helped my daughter get a plate of food, got her a juice box, and went to go get my own food. I then heard yelling and my daughter crying and went back to the table. Turns out, Marissa had told Eve she's childish and shouldn't want toys anymore and needs to grow up, and my sisters both agreed. Marissa told her that she should be braiding her own hair instead of a toy's fake hair and make herself pretty instead of making a toy pretty. My mom and my father were horrified and they had apparently heard Marissa and Brianna express this earlier and told them that they were being insensitive and will be in trouble if they tell me, my husband, or Eve that. Randy, the great brother he is, took Eve away from the situation and up to her room to calm down. I, as calmly as possible, explained for the millionth time that Eve is autistic. Her brain works differently, and if you were with her daily, you would see that her toys actually help her learn social skills, regulate her emotions, and calm her down. Brianna then said that, I baby her too much. We make meals for her, get her food, buy her toys, and drive her everywhere, when we should just force her to learn on her own. Brianna said that because she does school, she's normal enough to live on her own, the exact words. I told Brianna, Marissa, and Brianna's husband to leave. My other sister and her husband tried to defend them, saying that if I just cut the cord, Eve would learn how to survive. I told them to leave too. My husband is with me, as is my father, but my mother said I took it too far by kicking them out and saying I'm never letting them around Eve again. They really hurt Eve. Luckily, she's still playing with her toys, so they didn't seem to ruin her love of them but she's been sad and crying all day. I just put her to bed and started crying myself once she wasn't able to see me do it. Am I the jerk? I got Eve her food because she has pretty severe motor delays. She's about on the level of a five-year-old. Normally, I try to let her get her own food and if she makes a mess, I clean it up. But since there were platters of food, think buffet style on a kitchen counter, that if she spilled, it would make a hazard on the kitchen floor where other people could slip and my mom has had two knee replacements, so if she slips, that would have ruined Christmas even more. Her making a mess while eating isn't a worry, because I can clean it later, and nobody is going to be walking under the table to slip on it. We've worked with specialists since Eve's diagnosis to figure out the right way to both care for and foster independence. From some testing last year, specialists believe that Eve is at the level of a four or five-year-old socially, five-year-old motor skills, and academically 14. The problem is, she doesn't appear to have the cognitive ability to apply what she learns in school to the real world. For example, Eve could read a book and identify a character as mean because they don't understand. But she can only understand that my sisters and her cousin are mean, but not really why. Her language fluctuates from nonverbal to verbal with the language capability of a two-year-old to verbal with the language capability of a five-year-old. Her academic ability is an outlier, but the specialists don't seem too alarmed by it so we aren't either. Not the jerk. You're protecting your daughter. And hey, maybe by cutting the cord with your sister's family, you'll force them to learn some empathy. If any cords have to be cut, I'd be looking at the family before the daughter. They were cruel and thoughtless, and then they doubled down on it when you called it out. I'd have given them the boot too. OP did the right thing to protect her daughter. My sister demands to be paid for the labor she did for us on Christmas. My husband, who's 36, and I, 38 female, hosted Christmas this year at our house. My 20 living close family members, brothers, sisters, nieces, nephews, 
have stayed with us from the 18th and will continue until tomorrow. A further eight people joined us yesterday for Christmas dinner and a Christmas party. My older brother, who's 40, and his husband, who's 53, usually help me out with the Christmas dinner, and they did this year as well, but there were a few more guests than usual and we needed more hands on deck, so I asked my younger sister, who's 30, if she would help. She agreed, if reluctantly, once she saw how much needed to be done and we all got to work. She muttered when she started that I had better pay her back for this, to which I laughed because I thought it was a joke. There's a very high chance that I misinterpreted this because I do have autism and recognizing sarcasm is not one of my strong points. But she didn't object, so I took my interpretation as the correct one. I was, and am, incredibly grateful for her help and I thanked her for it many times. Once the cooking was done and the food was served in our dining room, I made sure to mention the contributions that everyone had made to the meal, by name, as I do every year. My sister then, this morning, just before she was about to leave, everything's packed up in her car, saying goodbye to everyone, asked me how much I was going to pay her. I asked her what she meant, and she said that she had agreed to do it with the idea that she would be paid for it, and she wasn't my slave. I said I wasn't going to pay her because it was a favor. Also, I've done a lot for her during her time here, so if anything, it was her paying me back. She just glared at me and asked again for her money, and I said I don't have anything for her. She didn't ask again and left after telling me that I was a jerk for no reason. We're normally on very good terms, so this was surprising. I don't remember us ever arguing before now, so I think I either did something very wrong or she was in a bad mood because she was hungover and I only did something slightly wrong. So Reddit, am I the jerk? Edit, people do help out in other ways, which is why I went to my sister, because she was the only one who wasn't busy. Not the jerk. I don't even understand this concept. At Christmas, everyone helps out, so that everyone can enjoy themselves. The payment is the finished meal that I'm sure your sister partook in. I can't imagine a majority of the adults in my family just sitting around not helping. Everyone is just in and out of the kitchen, cooking, tidying up, looking after the younger kids. Regardless of who's hosting, we all help out. Even me, who's disabled and physically can't help much, I can still do other things that are helpful, like keeping the kids entertained with crayons and paper, or holding a baby so the parents can do things in peace, and I bring stuff that I prepared beforehand. If someone demanded to be paid, I'd laugh too. Then we'd probably point out that everyone helps out and everyone has pitched in and buying food. Why should one person get paid for doing what all of us have done to have a nice Christmas together? Ex-mother-in-law is requesting a crazy amount of grandparent visitation. How do I move forward? My ex-mother-in-law has taken me to court for grandparent visitation. Background. My ex was incarcerated October 22nd, and since then, I have allowed visitation around one to two times a month, including his side of the family and their school activities and extracurriculars, and sent pictures and updates. I also set boundaries at this time. No involving the kids in his case, or discussing his case with them, no taking them to visit him, etc. Grandma decided to break some of those boundaries, so I started to limit when and where she could visit. Anyways, all that was going good enough, so Grandma requested every other weekend, Dad's schedule, holidays, vacation time, and daily phone calls. We went to court, and the judge pretty much said it's not Grandma's job to step into Dad's shoes, and it looks like Mom, me, was already allowing visitation, so they're going to have an uphill battle in her courtroom. Judge requested we go to mediation, then we would return to court later this year. Now their attorney has sent me a letter asking for Grandma to have every Sunday from 9 to 5. I don't agree with any weekend visitation time because she's trying to take the kids to visit Dad, and I'm concerned about her communication with the kids. Talking bad about me, asking them to delete messages and not show them to me, putting them in the middle of conflict. My oldest told me that they are no longer answering her calls because they're tired of grandma putting them in the middle of this. I was previously offering visits during the week, dinner dates, going to the mall, etc., but she was declining my offers. At this point, I don't feel comfortable offering any visits until there is a court order and stipulations around communication, prison visitation, etc. But do I need to respond to their attorney? Also, my plan is to try and be fair here, but also protect my kids. Offer limited monthly visitation, one to two dinners a month, 
no overnights, plus some holiday time. Offer to update them on events, an extended invite to school activities, put boundaries around communication, no visiting the prison, no putting them in the middle of conflict, and I would like to keep my parental decision-making rights that if grandma or her family continue to break these stipulations, that I can cease at any time without filing a modification. Does this seem fair, considering the circumstances? I can't find any information on what a grandparent visitation schedule would look like. Or do I ask the judge to throw this out completely because I was previously offering visits and grandma is clearly a toxic nutcase? Keep offering the weekday visits. Offer dinners with you and the kids, park visits, etc. Save all texts and declinings of the visits. Then you can say, over this time, I offered this amount of visiting opportunities, but she declined them. It will go a long way. Have your kids screenshot all of those messages and send them to you. Add a passcode to their phone so grandma can't delete them. If grandma says mean things, have your daughter write it down, in her own words. They may or may not consider it, but if you present this in parental alienation light, they probably will. You can also contact the prison and the state that if she arrives for a visit with the kids, she is to be denied because she did not get permission to bring them from their legal guardian, and your kids are not allowed to enter the facility. Update. We went to mediation and did not agree. Grandma went from asking for every other weekend to asking for every Sunday from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. and says that if that's too early, she would pick up the kids Saturday so they could just spend the night. Of course, I said that's not going to happen. I received a letter from their attorney telling me to bring my kids to court because the mediator communicated to him that they could interview the kids. I ignored the request. I submitted a supplemental declaration with exhibits about my concerns with grandma's behaviors. Grandma submitted a response full on bashing me, including false accusations. Honestly floored their attorney let that get sent out. When we went back to court, the attorney came up to me in the hallway to explain how court orders work, told me that a standard order includes language about no derogatory comments about the other party. Yes, I know. He asked me to send the kids to grandma's for Thanksgiving. I said no, they saw them last year for Thanksgiving, and even in custody orders between parents, one parent typically does not get every holiday every year. Then he threatened me with counsel, and the judge would order my kids to come to court. Spoiler, she denied his request. Anyways, the judge seemed very much on my side and did not agree with grandma's behavior. Agreed with my boundaries I set from the beginning and was pleased that one of them included for them to also not talk bad about the kid's father. Overall, I've been reasonable. Judge commented that she feels most of this could be resolved if the petitioner would have reasonable expectations and requests for visitation. Well, their attorney asks for an evidentiary hearing. Judge looked annoyed, but from what I understand, if you request it, you pretty much get it unless the court can find good cause to deny the request. Your mother-in-law has lost perspective on reality and her attorney is making bank by trying to draw things out in court. By the time this case is done, one grandkid will be 16 and the other will be 11. That's old enough for a significant contribution of the evidence to come from them. It's not going to be found in mother-in-law's favor and will most likely have the opposite effect of having the kids immensely dislike her. Am I the jerk for kicking my son and his girlfriend out? I, 55 female, have two kids, George who's 31 and Gabrielle who's 29. Gabrielle recently got engaged and I'm helping her plan the wedding in my spare time, which the entire family is very excited for, except George. George recently divorced his wife of seven years, Susanna, 28 female, after he said the spark had died and gone out. They have a set of twins together, Amy and Alice, who are six, and are trying to set up a healthy co-parenting relationship. Susanna is a great mother to my grandkids, and I was disappointed in George for giving up so fast on their relationship without even trying couples counseling but it wasn't my business or place to say anything. The drama started when George brought his new girlfriend to dinner at my house. He met his girlfriend, Bethany, who's 25, through a work colleague, and they've been dating for four months now. At dinner, Gabrielle and I were discussing flower arrangements, and Bethany felt the need to ask George if he'd ever marry again. George coughed before replying that he'd have to think about it, which Bethany seemed to deflate at. Well, this caused Alice to cry about how she wants mommy and daddy to love each other again. George and Bethany just sat there while my granddaughter screamed. 
After I comforted Alice, I pulled George aside and asked if he was sure about Bethany, which he told me was none of my business. I told him it was my business who he invited into my home and my grandkids' lives, since I've been caring for them in my spare time while he works. He and Susanna have 50-50 custody. George got angry and said it was Gabrielle's fault for mentioning weddings in the first place. I told him to stop acting like a kid and to be happy for his sister. Then Bethany felt the need to insert herself and tell me that she and George were together, no matter how much I liked his ex-wife. After that, I was done with the conversation and I asked them both to leave. George and Bethany stormed off and left my grandkids at my house at 7 p.m. I had to call Susanna to come get her kids since they had school in the morning and I was attending a cake tasting with Gabrielle the next day. I feel like I shouldn't have to tell my 31-year-old son to be happy for his sister or argue with a random woman whom I have never met before in my own home. So, am I the jerk? George needs to pay for daycare for a while. OP. The truth is, George can't afford daycare with the child support and alimony he owes Susanna. I agreed to babysit my grandkids as a favor to him. I love my grandkids, but I wish George would appreciate the thousands of dollars I'm saving him each month. Maybe they need to rethink the custody agreement if he can't care for them. OP. If Susanna took on more custody, then George would owe her for more child support, which he's already struggling to afford. Plus, it would mean that Susanna would have to work part-time hours, which isn't really an option in her industry. Alice needs counseling. OP. My husband and I have suggested that George pay for her to get some counseling but he keeps saying that he needs to save and he can't afford it. What exactly were you asking when you asked if he was sure about Bethany? I was asking if it was really the right time to introduce her to the family, since his daughters are still sensitive about the divorce and are trying to come to terms with it. I didn't ask him in the context of, is Bethany right for you? I meant it as in, are you sure this is the right time to introduce her? I didn't inherently dislike Bethany, but maybe it would have been better to introduce her to my grandkids after they've recovered from the divorce. Did George ask if he could bring Bethany beforehand? OP. George asked me if Bethany could come 20 minutes before he was supposed to arrive, so it's not like I could say no at that point. Update. Bethany came to my house to apologize for how she acted at dinner last week. She told me that she was two months pregnant and George had broken up with her after she told him because he has too much responsibility and didn't want to be in the baby's life. I then spent the better part of three hours talking with Bethany about the baby and what she wants. She says she wants to keep the baby even if George refuses to be in their life, and I told her that I would help with childcare if she needs it since she doesn't have any family that live nearby. Before I got angry with George, I thought I would call him and give him a chance to explain. George was angry that Bethany had shown up at his house and insisted that it wasn't his baby. I told him that he should get a paternity test and he asked me for $500 to cover it since he's struggling. I told George that he needs to figure it out himself since he's about to be a father of three and that he better step up and do right by his kids. George then hung up. Well, two hours later, I get a call from Susanna to say that George hadn't picked up the kids like he'd previously agreed to and could she drop them off at my place because she had work. I agreed for her to drop them off and I tried to call George again. I called 12 times and they all went to voicemail. I don't know where George is and I've called his place of employment to try and find out. However, they refuse to tell me anything. I've agreed to watch the kids until Wednesday and Susanna has reported this incident to the authorities. I assume she plans to file for full custody and I can't blame her. Right now I'm worried that George has run off somewhere and done something irresponsible. I'm just disgusted and I will not be doing him any favors in the future unless he has a very good explanation and accepts some responsibility. This was hard to write, but felt good to get off my chest. Thank you everyone for responding. Hey OP, you're disappointed in your son for giving up on his marriage so easily and I'll bet dollars to donuts that you and your daughter-in-law have been telling the twins that mommy and daddy are getting back together. I bet you asked your granddaughter to say something like that to Help daddy realize that it would make everyone happy. You need to butt out of your kids' personal lives and get a darn hobby. OP, you owe me quite a few donuts then, since you'd be dead wrong. I'll poke my nose in my son's business when he's being an irresponsible parent and not taking accountability for his kids. Bethany is pregnant, 
It says time to have the twins and he's nowhere to be found. It just proves to me I should have made his personal life even more of my business. Alice caused drama and you exacerbated it by asking about Bethany. OP. Alice is six years old. She hardly meant to cause drama as you put it. She's a six-year-old kid who doesn't understand why her parents are no longer together. I never asked George if he was sure about Bethany in the context of, is she the one? I meant it in the context of, are you sure this is the right time to introduce her to the kids? I don't care who George ends up dating, but he has kids to think about, and my granddaughters need to come before any random woman he's been seeing for four months. Update. People suggested that I give George some space and time to figure things out, as a recently divorced father, but after he ran off around two months ago, I ended up filing a missing persons report. I talked to George's workplace the day after I filed the report, and they told me he had given his two weeks about a month ago. I then tried calling George again, and he finally picked up. He told me he was okay, but he had moved states, and no longer wanted any contact with his kids, because it was all too much responsibility for him. I snapped at George, and told him he couldn't just decide now that he didn't want to be a father. Then George told me he never wanted kids in the first place, and those kids don't look anything like me anyway. George then told me to buzz off and hung up the phone. After that, I informed the police what had happened to let them know that George wasn't in any danger and that we knew his whereabouts. After that happened, I just cried because I couldn't believe that I had raised such a selfish person. Susanna has filed for full custody, and George, as far as I know, is refusing to pay child support and will probably end up in jail at some point. Bethany is now four months pregnant and is having a boy, and George is the father. Somehow he managed to come up with a $500, so he will have to pay child support since he doesn't plan on being in the baby's life. Bethany moved into my home in November since she's had trouble doing things herself, and her doctor says she's at risk if she becomes too stressed during the pregnancy. In that time, we've gotten closer, and despite how our first meeting went, I actually have come to like Bethany. Sorry this isn't the happy ending some of you wanted. I've been following the advice I received from the first post and I have not contacted George and he's not tried to contact me. I can only hope with time he pulls himself together and manages to step up as a father. Thank you to everyone who gave helpful advice. Would I be the jerk for telling my friend I won't pet sit because of a stipulation her husband made? I, 30 female, have a friend, 30 female, we'll call her Cass, who asked me to watch her and her husband's, David, their pets, which are two cats and two dogs, from the 22nd to the 27th of December for them to spend time with family. David's mom bought plane tickets for them to visit for Christmas, and David had planned on having one of his friends watch the pets. Apparently, David and this friend had a falling out over League of Legends, and he burned that bridge with a very vicious comment. Cass asked me if I would be willing to watch the pets for them for the same amount they would have paid the other friend, $500. Cass also offered to cover my gas since I live about 40 minutes away without traffic, but would usually be around one to one and a half hours due to traffic. I agreed to help pet sit under the impression that I would be going back and forth from my house to hers. I asked to meet with the pets before and get any information I needed in their care, etc. So we set a date to do that about three weeks before they left. We met up and I made lots of notes and also wanted to meet her husband so he knew who was taking care of his pets and house while he was away. It was while I was on this visit that I learned that they wanted me to stay at the house overnight while they were gone and be at the house a good part of the time. They were willing to offer their food and use of their entertainment services on their TV. This was fine with me as I thought it was fair and such. Now, I had only been dealing with Cass up to this point and I barely met her husband for two to three minutes for the first time ever since he was asleep till noon and was focused on building furniture that just came in when he was awake. Now things went downhill this afternoon because Cass wanted to talk since she was having anxiety about leaving her cat that she brought into the relationship. She has been at home with all of the pets since she quit her job earlier this month and even before that would visit and let them out during lunch, which is also something David would do as well. To help quell her anxiety, I talked with her and got the last bit of info she wanted to relay. One was a stipulation David wanted to tack on, which was me not leaving the pets more than three hours. I had already moved my work schedule for both of my jobs to accommodate for me staying overnight to watch the pets. However, I was under the impression that I would be able to leave the pets for a relatively normal amount of time 
that I would need to leave my own dogs alone for when I have work, four to six hours minimum. When I told Cass that I had planned to spend time with my significant other's family on the 24th and my own family on the 25th, but I would be willing to limit it only to my family's Christmas since I knew that would be a bit too much time for both over two days and three hours would not be enough time for presents, food, cleanup, dessert, and the two plus hours needed to travel from their house to mine and back for my family Christmas. Since it was his stipulation, she needed to talk with him about it, but knew he'd get mad because I couldn't say yes to his stipulation. My friend said she would just stay home with the pets, which she knew would upset her husband as well. She texted me about an hour later, telling me he was mad and would allow the six hours I estimated, but would take off $50 and wrote things that were obvious things I would do taking care of the pets as if I didn't have enough sense to do them in the first place. Now this upset me since me spending time with my family on Christmas should not be a point of contention and wanting to be honest about the amount of time it should take should not be up for debate. If this was such an important point, it should have been mentioned when I was getting all of the other information and not days before they leave. I originally planned to counter since the amount I would be paid per hour would be $3.47 and so for 6 hours to be deducted it would be about $20 and just say he could take that off but honestly his disregard for me wanting to celebrate with my family while he goes out to visit his own is just really unrealistic. So would I be the jerk for telling them they need to find someone else? Not the jerk. You've been very accommodating, and the husband, at least, seems manipulative. I would be curious what their relationship is like, because your friend seems a bit wary of her husband. OP. To be honest, I've been uncomfortable with him since they started dating five or six months ago. They got married at the end of October or beginning of November because she got pregnant, and she officially moved into his house a month before that. He seemed to rush everything, and she seemed to be swept up in that alarmingly quick. Exactly. OP needs to understand that she has the power in this transaction here. She needs to tell them to forget his stipulations and find someone else. Today is the 19th. They're not going to find any pet boarders this late and likely not going to find anyone willing to do this. Instead of him docking the pay, I tell them to pay more. For four pets over five days and affecting her holidays, $500 isn't enough. Of course, I don't expect the husband to be rational, considering he's a 30-year-old who had a falling out with a friend over League of Legends. OP. When he decided to cut the $50 off the original compensation, I knew immediately he did it out of anger and to try and manipulate me into doing what he wanted by scaring me into it. He thought he could control me the way he does anything else. However, I have a lot of experience with emotionally immature behaviors and refuse to play whatever game they want. Update. I'm sure many of you are wondering what I did in this situation, and I decided not to pet sit for them. I messaged my friend this morning telling her, I honestly don't think I'm the right fit for you and your husband for pet sitting now. I'm sorry, but you guys need to find someone else. This was a difficult decision to make, but I just do not feel comfortable now with the turn of events that have occurred. So far, she hasn't responded. I'm perfectly fine with this because I don't think having her and her husband is something I want. I'm a recovering people pleaser and really needed to know that my boundary was reasonable. But your support really helped me see this. I will be enjoying my Christmas stress-free with my family and my own dogs. I will also be spending time celebrating with my significant other and my very, very supportive friends. Some things that I also wanted to address, I've been friends with her for about 15 years. 11 of those have been long distance and we haven't been that close in recent years. She's only known her husband for 6 months and they've been married for 3 of those. They did not have a ceremony but went to City Hall to get married so I didn't have the chance to meet him before checking out the pets. I'm worried about her being in this marriage because since she is pregnant and seemed to be swept up very quickly with him. I had been on alert about him since he had her meet his son on their second date which also made me question his parenting as well. His blow up with his friend that was supposed to pet sit wasn't over a single game but over them thinking he cheated on rank games since he did worse when playing with them and he said it was because he played with them for fun. Am I the jerk for telling my mom I'm staying with my dad full time until I don't have to share my room? I, 15 female, live one week with my dad and another with my mom. They divorced three years ago and my mom has been dating John for a year. 
John and I don't hate each other, but we're not close. We all live in the same town, as most of my dad's side of the family, so other than my music lessons, I also hung out a lot with my cousins and didn't spend a lot of time around John. A month ago, John and his daughter, Trisha, who's 11, moved in temporarily into my house because there was a fire at theirs. My house has two bedrooms, so Trisha has to stay in my room. My bed is a bunk bed because I was getting a sister, but my mom lost them. Trisha and I hung out only a few times before this, but I can say the same about her and John. I don't hate her, but she turns out to be hard to live with. She has long hair and her hair is everywhere. She talks in her sleep and I was woken up five or six times since her stay. She also sometimes tried to speak to me when I already turned off my lamp, a sign that I was going to sleep. I talked to my mom and she said I needed to be nicer to her since she's been through a lot, that my issues were just minor inconveniences, that Trisha would be back at her own home soon, in late January. I talked to my dad and he said I could just move in with him until Trisha leaves. I then packed my bags and told my mom I'll be staying at dad's. She blew up at me, saying what a spoiled brat I am and that I'm making John and Trisha feel horrible for imposing. I just left. It's been a week now and my mom never reached out to me. She dropped my Christmas presents at my grandma's because my dad and I would celebrate Christmas there. I don't think my mom can get the law involved because I'm 15 and I just have to tell them the living situation and they should understand. Besides, it's only till I can have my room back again. Still, am I the jerk? Not the jerk, but your dad should have had a conversation with your mom and he went about this the wrong way. As a family court attorney, I have a different view on much of this. In my state, if your mom got the law involved, you could be made to return. I'm often asked if at 12, 14, or 16, can I make the decision where I live or my kid can pick? The answer is the court will consider your wishes in my state, but not let you pick. In the same way, if you pick your dad, your mom can't just turn off paying support or disown you. There are rights and responsibilities involved. People too often think every case is a reasonable teen who can pick and forget that if the law freely allowed kids to just pick sides, that it would be really, really easy for kids to play parents completely off each other and end up with zero supervision. All this is to say, I think you have some real feelings. I think people should listen to you. I don't think either of your parents are acting like adults. I, male 32, think I saw my baby's chart and I can't be the father. My wife is 30. We had a difficult birth. Everything is fine, mother is recovering and the baby is doing well. I went to talk to the nurse and a chart was up on the computer. I think they listed our baby as type B blood. There was a lot on the screen, a lot going on, and my head was swimming so I'm not certain that's what it said and I'm not even certain that was our kid's chart. We're both type A. We donate blood, so I'm 100% certain of our blood types. It doesn't immediately register, but I checked and that shouldn't be possible, meaning I'm not the father if our baby has type B blood. I'm not sure what to do next. Should I ask my wife? She's still recovering and I don't want to stress her out unnecessarily. Can I ask the hospital to see the chart? We're already home. Do I just get a home paternity test and wait to get the results? Edit. I called the hospital this morning and they told me how to access the web portal and get the lab results. Blood type is listed as B, but there is no RH factor listed, positive or negative. So I was right in what I was seeing, but the info is incomplete or inaccurate. Two A parents can have an A or an O baby. All the other theories are basically impossible, including hospitals switching the baby. There are only two realistic possibilities, in order of what I think most likely. 1. The labs are wrong. Or 2. I'm not the father. I'm not going to talk to my wife about this because it doesn't lead anywhere good right now. Oh, for goodness sake. Just ask the nurse what your baby's blood type is. If there's one thing I've learned from Reddit, it's you should immediately accuse your wife of cheating. Go stay with your mom and get your mom to also accuse your wife of cheating. Then get a paternity test and when it comes back that you are the father, you get mad at your wife for being mean about it and blow up your marriage. Please don't forget to also have all of your friends and relatives blow up her phone. I called out my brother's girlfriend for being a gold digger after she googled the cost of our Christmas gifts. My brother James has a girlfriend, Lindsay, who he's been dating for 7 months. He decided to bring her to Christmas at my house, 
stay over Christmas Eve, and leave the next day after lunch. I had met Lindsay at drinks before this, and she seemed nice. When they arrived, Lindsay walked in and complimented my decorations, large tree in the foyer, and asked how much they cost. I was a bit surprised by the question, but I just said, more than I'd like, and moved on. Throughout the evening, she asked several questions centered around money. She asked my husband how much he paid for our house, my stepdad how much money he made in his previous job, how much my watch cost. She even googled one of our art pieces to see how much it sold for and started talking about how crazy it was that we spent that much, which frankly was very uncomfortable. My stepdad pulled my brother aside and asked if there was a problem, but my brother just said it was normal for her to do that, but he did say he'd speak to her about it. On Christmas morning, we all gathered around to open presents, and thankfully, Lindsay hadn't said anything else, so I figured James had spoken to her about her intrusive questions. However, at lunch, we were talking about plans for January, and Lindsay proudly said she didn't know how we could afford to do anything in January as she added up the total we had spent on gifts, and then proudly proclaimed the total amount. The whole table went silent, and honestly, I was equal parts shocked and annoyed that someone could be so ignorant. I looked at Lindsay and said, You are the world's most diligent gold digger. Seriously, would you like to be the family accountant since you're already tracking expenses? Lindsay stuttered out an apology and tried to explain, but my stepdad just changed the conversation and we moved on. She was mercifully quiet for the rest of dinner. After they left, my brother messaged me saying that I'd really upset Lindsay and I was out of line with what I said. I argued that he had said he had talked to her and he clearly didn't. Not that someone should have needed guidance to know how crass her comments were. He's saying I owe both of them an apology, but I think Lindsay's behavior was disgraceful. My parents say Lindsay was wrong, but I probably should have said something in private, or they could have, and I shouldn't have said something in front of everyone. Am I the jerk? All of these everyone sucks here is and you're the jerk replies are dumbfounding. Have any of you people ever had an interaction with an actual human being? In what world is asking people about how much money they make and adding up the totals of Christmas gifts normal? Not the jerk. She was being incredibly rude and obviously making everyone uncomfortable. I just don't understand why everyone here is making excuses for her, semantics of the terminology or not. Why would you sit there and add up the total of what a family spent and then tell them about it? They know. Whether you grew up with money or not, common sense is required, unless she's on the spectrum which is the common excuses the you're the jerks and everyone sucks here people are giving. But come on, people here always get defensive when someone posts here and is from a wealthier background, constantly making excuses. If this was reversed, would you guys be okay with it? If she googled how much a pair of socks or how much an old TV was and passed a comment, if she went on about how little the family spent and then declared at Christmas morning, oh, you guys should have loads of money in January since you spent so little during Christmas, would you all be making the same comments? I doubt it. You'd be up in arms and calling her a snob. Not the jerk, and I really don't get the people saying you are the jerk. It's so unbelievably rude to make so many comments about money. I could see maybe one or two offhanded comments, but to fixate on money so much that you tally up how much money was spent on Christmas presents and then announce it to the whole family? Don't apologize to your brother. Why should you? His girlfriend came into your house for Christmas and immediately started questioning you about money and practically appraising everything in your house. She should be apologizing to you and your brother should be apologizing on her behalf. If someone is rude to you, you're allowed to defend yourself and shut them down, which is what you did. Maybe next time she'll learn to keep her mouth shut and not constantly talk about money. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or their brother's girlfriend? Please let us know. How much did you pay for that suit, Reddit boy? Anything over $20 and you got ripped off. Am I the jerk for removing the door to my son's room indefinitely? Yesterday, while I was making lunch, I heard a really loud sound, as if the ceiling was falling or a bookshelf had fallen. My husband, 41, male, and our daughter, 17, were out. The only other person in the house was my son, who's 16. I was pretty sure he was in his room, which is at the opposite side of the house from the kitchen, so while making my way there, I checked every room and everything seemed in order. I knocked on my son's door and called his name. No answer. I must have knocked and called three times before trying to open the door, which was locked. At this point, I was getting really freaked out, thinking that maybe he had tipped his wardrobe or bookshelf and it had fallen over him and he was passed out on the floor. I was basically screaming in his name, but no answer. I have no idea how I did it. I just threw myself into the door and it broke. 
Now, clearly the door was already weak. I'm thinking termites. But yeah, it broke. My son was fine. He was freaked out about the door, but he was fine. The sound was his TV with the volume at the max, apparently, and he didn't answer me calling because he didn't want me bothering his movie. His words were, You were screaming like a harpy and it was annoying. I was trying to watch the movie. Fix the door. I said no. I wasn't going to fix it since to fix it, I would have to buy a new door and doors are expensive. And as soon as his dad got home, he would remove the door entirely as it was too broken to just stay there. He got really mad, said it's his right to have a door. He deserves his privacy. I said he had a door, and while I was the one that broke it, it was a consequence of his actions. So if he wanted a door, he would have to buy it. I know he doesn't have the money for it right now. Until then, no door. He can change in the bathroom. He said, forget you. I said he was grounded. Am I the jerk about the door? My husband is fine with it. Says only I know how scared I was, so only I can know the appropriate punishment. I'm now terrified that if anything happens where we really need to reach my son, we won't be able to. But I have calmed down since, and I'm wondering if I'm the jerk. Not the jerk. Replace the door, remove the TV from his room. You would be the jerk for not getting him a new door. He needs privacy. He doesn't need a TV. Think of different and better ways to discipline that don't remove his privacy and space. Kids typically don't need a TV. If he didn't answer because of the TV, take that away and not his door. I usually say parents are always jerks for taking away doors, but this, absolutely not the jerk. But you and your husband need to sit down and think about how to fix your son's behavior ASAP because he's way out of line. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or her son? Please let us know. Yowza, having a son that acts like that no wonder some folks are deciding they don't want to have kids. Do this next. Tap here on your screen to come see our new podcast playlist, where you'll find thousands of hours of the best stories you've ever heard. Or tap the one on the right. That episode is specifically just for you, based on other videos you've enjoyed the most.